Aloha. Aloha. Oh, nice. How beautiful. Uh, just love hearing everybody's voice. And uh, yeah, so my name is Dashiell Kerr. I'm the executive director for Hawaii Institute of Pacific Agriculture. Uh, very just so thrilled to see all the beautiful faces in the house. And uh, I'm just, I'm really happy about the, the turnout for this class. And also generally uh, what feels like momentum and interest for this vision of a movement to create regional food security and to mitigate climate and to come together as a village and a community to create a rural local economy, which seems like one of the most prudent pressing things we can do in face of all of these challenges that we're facing. Uh, so this is part of a, a multi-workshop educational series, a seed to market initiative uh, that is a multi-organization, multi-year effort, again, to drive up regional production. We want to get as many backyard growers, local farmers, local landowners activated as we possibly can so we can start to have some volume of some things. Uh, you know, the Kohala Food Hub is currently a project of hip agriculture and uh, you know, we have the opportunity to, to gain some state funds and supports to launch that. Basically, as a space where we could aggregate and distribute fresh produce uh, to Department of Education. Uh, we, need a, we need a wash pack that's uh, GAP certified, uh, D, DOD vendor approved, so we can get these fresh foods into the school. So we had the state funds to invest and put in that community infrastructure, and currently we steward that project, but ultimately, we see that eventually becoming its own cooperative, its own nonprofit, maybe its own LLC that's run by the community. And, and I share that just to let you know that we envision this as being shared processing infrastructure, you know, that's, that's available for this hui of regional growers. And, and what is that prayer? What is that prayer for Kohala? You know, um, is it our, our forests restored, our rivers running clean? Uh, a lattice work of family farms that are producing a, a diversity and abundance of fresh vegetables and fruits that are shared into our local market, you know, over to our school system, maybe over to our West Side hotels. So that's kind of that's kind of the prayer and the vision again is to bring these incredible expert educators that can share with us uh, their mana'o about uh, specific crops to empower you all to grow those in your yard. Uh, just since our last presentation uh, with the launch of the CSA and uh, some additional promotion of trying to get uh, the online market going at the Food Hub, we've seen a, was it a, a six, a six-fold increase through Kohala Food Hub. And uh, just since our last presentation, we had uh, the first hotel order a standing order of shaved coconuts, which is really cool. Uh, for those of you that were at the last workshop, it was about dwarf coconuts and coconuts, and we're, we're trying to drive up regional production. And, and you know, Coco Vinny, he's like calling me. He's like, how many coconuts can you get us a week? Like, how many coconuts can you promise? And I'm like, I don't, I don't know. Like, we still, we still need more growers, you know, basically. So, again, I'll shout out Trent. Uh, Trent's got his incredible dwarf coconut nursery. If you didn't get dwarf coconuts last time, you can uh, reconnect with him. Uh, we did bring Taro Huli today. Uh, that we're going to be giving out the taro huli. Uh, and then also we brought some some ava starts that we're going to be selling. Uh, so you'll have an opportunity to to get down with those crops as well. And, and what are we doing, right? Like we're rolling out these different crops and it, we're creating ecology in our backyard, right? In permaculture, that's kind of, we design man-made ecologies. And why do we want to create this um, multi-layered food store, food store in their backyard? I was thinking on the way over here, like some people want, um, you know, home security alarm systems, that makes them feel safe. Like for me, I feel safe with food abundance around me and a, an ecology of plants that I can derive my starches and sugars and medicines from. And so we wanna empower that for you all as well uh, so that you, can, you too can live in a state of uh, food security and food abundance. Oh, are you guys excited about today's presentation? I'm uh, so thrilled and honored uh, to invite, you know, one of our leading uh, Kahlo and Ava experts in the state, if we can give a, a warm uh, applause for Katyana. <laughs> Katyana Reynolds. Mahalo. 
appreciate it. Um, is this good? Can, can you hear me on the microphone? Okay, yeah. I'm not as um, impassioned as Dash sometimes. I don't drink, I don't drink coffee, so. Um. Hey, um, hey, mahalo everyone for being here. I uh, actually don't like that word expert. Definitely not an expert. I'm just uh, learning along with all of you. And so grateful to be here and to, to learn. Um, yeah, before we start, I, I just want to speed around the room real quick. If you can kahe out two names. The name that you go by, especially if it's your last name, so I can know who you are, and then the aina that you call home. And um, I'll start, and then we got to go fast, because we don't have much time, but I need to know who all of you are, and that will come into play later on in our um, presentation and talk story today. But um, yeah, my name is Kaiana Runnels, I'm from the Ahupua of Kihalani in Lao Pahoehoe. And then maybe we'll just go hit this side of the room and work our way over. Um, Auntie's in the front. Loud, if can. Loud. Cat from Javi. Javi, cat. Christina from Javi. Javi. Kayum from Javi. Javi. Avis is our last name, and we're up at 1500 feet as well. Oh, my Kay. Mahalo. Kapa'au. Kapa'au. Okay. Mahalo. Kapa'au. Okay, mahalo. Better in the back. Kapa'au. And then let's hit this front row if can. Okay. Oh, wow, you drove far. Kapa'au. Oh, mahalo. Okay. 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 Oh, yeah. Mahalo. Oh, yeah. Okay. Mahalo. We'll get the back right now, if can. We don't want to forget about you guys. Real loud. Okay. Mahalo. Okay. Drove far too. Oh, Javi is in the house. Makes sense. That's where we are. Um, okay, and in the front row over here, if you can. We, 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 uh, Kauai, hi. Wow. Mahalo. Yeah, Pu Kapu. Yeah, Mahalo. Okay. Hey, I know you, Jesse. Mahalo. Okay, right down the road, yeah. Okay. Oyakea, mahalo. Mena keiki, elua. Hola, amelia. Lilia, liliha opio, mahalo. And then in the back, tutitas. Mahalo. Okay. My kai, so, um, cameraman, we need you guys too. Your names and um, where you're from. Kohala. Kohala Nuya Kea. Thomas Kona, mahalo. Okay, so, um, yeah, now I feel more comfortable and feel like we know each other a little bit. Um, and that will, that, that's really important, especially when we start talking about color varieties and names and the importance of a name. Uh, we will talk about a lot about that. But, um, yeah, so to introduce myself a little bit, um, I'm a mahi ai, uh, and I've grown food my, my whole life. It's been my... A weird obsession. I've learned about and collected. I've spent probably the last, you know, 12 to 13 years traveling the islands, 
re- reconnecting with uh, Mahi Ai and their Ahupua'as where they live, visiting their lo'i, their mala, collecting their kalo varieties, um, learning the names, who they are, um, and bringing these stories back as well as the kalo varieties if they allow it back with me. And I malama that at, at our aina, um, at the Kohala Center in Namoku in Honoka'a. And so we have um, many, well over a hundred kalo varieties, all have names, all have stories. We also hold the Ava collection, the Ko collection, the Maia collection, and we're working on our Uala collection right now. Um, with all their names and stories, we know who they are just by looking at them. Uh, just like all of you know who your kids are, your parents are, your cousins are, just by looking at them. And, and some of their stories, we know our Kalo and, and Ava the same way. And so, um, yeah, slide man. I don't know who the slide man is. If you can, there you go. Okay, so the title of this presentation is called Ohaha. Ohaha is a term I came across in a lot of my studies, and it was an old term used to describe um, a vigorous growing kalo patch. And Ohaha has the connotation to it of of a, a healthy and thriving state. So Kalo is so healthy and vigorous that not just the makua is healthy, but all the oha, right? The keiki around are, are healthy. And so ohaha has the root term oha, which has, um, you know, links to the word ohana, right? Oha, and then na is that reduplication of oha, signifying all of these oha thriving together. Hey, Uncle David. Um, so, no, no shame, no shame. Come sit down. This variety of kalo right here is called kalo kalalau. It was found in kalalau. Some of our kalo don't get traditional names anymore because we can't figure out who they are. They don't match descriptors of any of the ike we have. And you guys all well know the, the variety pololu here. That is not a traditional name for that kalo. That was named after where it was found. Um, Japanese call it bakatare. I don't know if you knew that or if you know what that means. Um, yeah, bakatare means stupid. And, um, you know, why would, why would they name it stupid? Well, it's because you would have to be stupid to kui that kalo if it was not hot. Um, and we've seen that before, too. We did a kui kalo at the Waimea uh, Makahiki one year. And my friend brought up all the kalo, and, and I was hoping he would reheat it before he brought it up, and he didn't. And, and Waimea is anu anu, like real cold. We bring out the pololu, we put them on the papas, and the kids start to kui, and it is just like rocket missiles launching <laughs> at everybody. And so... Um, Pololu, pakatari, you have to be stupid to kui if, it, if it's not hot because it's just so pa'a. Like it would break all the poi miller's machines. That's one of the reasons why when they commercialized and monetized our older brother, Haloa, they narrowed it down to just a few varieties, the soft varieties that uh, ferment a little bit slower of just two colors. Yeah, if you go to the store, what color is your poi? Why at KTA, there's purple. Yeah, if there's purple, it's Maui Lehua or a hybrid off of Lehua. And then if it's... Gray, it's moi. A lot of people on Oahu grow moi. A lot of people on Kauai grow moi. Um, but there's danger in narrowing down the diversity of our, of our kalo, and we'll explain why. Um, so, ohaha, vigorous, thriving. Not just a kalo plant, but a symbol for us as kanaka, as ohana, as lahui. So I want to honor my, one of my kumus, um, Anakala Jerry Kononui. The top picture is at his hale in Pahoa. Um, and... Well, I had a really close relationship with him before we moved here from Oahu. We were in Haula, and um, every time he would come for the Waimea Kalo Festival, the Ava Festival, or just any visit he had to Oahu, he would invite me to come learn from him. And um, when I moved here, we would just go to his hale right down the road from where we lived in Ola'a. And this is, um, you know, Uncle Jerry, he's, he's, he's a very um, kupuna style educator. He doesn't just give you answers. Um, and if he does give you answers, it's because he doesn't care. Like, he's like, ah, just give him the answer and they'll walk away. But if he really wants to learn to occur and go deep, he'll throw palu. Yeah, we call it um, throwing bait. And he'll throw bait and he'll throw bait. Today, I'm, I'm going to be throwing palu at all of you, and hopefully I can hook a few of you. And, um, and you know, sometimes with me and my other brothers that, that learn from him, um, the hook sank real deep. We took the palu, yeah. And this is uh, at his hale. He's teaching me some things about kui when, you know, I had already learned so much about, from Uncle Jerry about kalo identification and, and varieties. And, 
and Mo'olelo, and we were kui one day at um, Kamehameha School's Ho'olaulea. We do a kui station there every year. Um, and he was like, hey, Ka'iana, you, you should come over again. I think there's some things that I can show you about kui. And that was his really nice way of saying that my kui was terrible, yeah? And so I go over to his hale, and he teaches me all these little tricks and things that, that make it a more efficient process, rhythm, um, strokes, different types of strokes, um, how you adapt to different textures of kalo. And, you know, if you see in this picture, his grandson, Hayden, is, is watching. He's right there. And now Hayden is a kumu, he's a senior, and he is the one educating a lot of these haumana uh, about how to kui kalo. So, Uncle Jerry never taught his daughters too much about this ike. Um, although they have a lot of it, he didn't directly teach it to them. And so we, are, we have the kulena to pass it on to Hayden and his other mo'opuna as well, um, his other grandkids. And so I just want to honor him. A lot of this ike you hear today comes from him as well as his, um, his ohana line of, of knowledge. So this is where we mahi at Namoku. We also mahi at our house. But this plot at Namoku holds the, the Kalo variety collection. And um, just wanted to give you an image of, of what it looks like. So we can skip this. So significance of Kalo, of, of Haloa in the Ohana. Um, you know, it was interesting in our research. We all know the story of Haloa and how we tie back to him. And I've hit Haloa on four of my Ohana lines. Um, we've gotten that far back. And, and it's not that hard to do, especially if you're Kanaka and you hit an ali'i line, all of that mo'oku how that genealogy is done for you already. But um, yeah, so with, with Haloa, the most commonly told version of that mo'oku how of, of Haloa's genealogy um, from Kalakawa, from Puku'i, from all of these early scholars and, and chiefs are, are, is one version with um, Papa and Wakea, Ho'oho Kukalani, Ho'oho Kukalani, Wakea, Haloa. Haloa is a baby, a keiki alu alu, a stillborn. They canoe that baby on the eastern side of the Halepea, up sprouts the first kalo plant. But we have found over seven genealogies that differ from that genealogy, and all of them are maika'i, and all of them are true. And it's tough to maybe conceptualize that in your head, but mo'olelo and Hawaii um, have different tales, and they shift. And so it's important for us to learn all of these, these stories. But one of the versions that I read I really loved was Ho'oho Kukulani had a stillborn. That stillborn baby, she kanu on the eastern side of her hale. So Ho'oho Kukulani kanus the baby in the ground. And she cries, she uwe, she, she sheds this tear. And it's a very specific tear in this version that, that I love the word. The tear that Ho'oho Kukulani cries is called Ha'lo'ilo'i. Can you guys pull out some words there that you know already? Ha lo i lo i. Yeah. Yeah. So if ho o ho ku kalani planted the first kalo plant, created the first lo i with her ha lo i lo i, who was the first mahi ai in Hawaii? Ho o ho ku kalani. Yeah. Or in some versions, ho o ho kulani, ho kulani. Um, and so. If Ho'oho Kukalani was the first Mahi'ai and every one of you that are Kanaka can trace your lines back to her, then you are Mahi'ai in your koko. And if you ever think that you can't do it or you're inadequate or you don't know where to turn or how to start, know it's in your DNA. All of you who aren't from Hawaii as well, guarantee can trace your lineage back to someone who is growing food pretty recently. So just know that it's in your blood. Um, the significance of, of haloa in the ohana is very critical. In Hawaii, we, we practice this method of planting called makaalua. Makaalua is where you dig a pit and you plant two huli in one hole. It's a very puna style, a kononui ohana style of planting. And that's because we never planted kalo by themselves. That is a foreign thought, that's a, that's a foreign mana'o. When you see all of these lo'i with straight single plantings in single rows, that's, that's a mana opake. That's a Chinese thought process for planting rice. Uh, we did not grow kalo like that traditionally. Um, there is all evidence, and every picture we have shows two different methods. Makalua planting in twos is one of the, the most prevalent methods. 
And that's because kalo grow in ohana. They don't grow by themselves. They thrive with ohana. And you will notice that when, when you grow kalo together, they become happier. Yeah? Your brain tells you, no, it don't make sense because they can compete for nutrients. But no, they, they, they grow better together. Because um, the roots talk story on the ground. They keep each other company. They feed each other as opposed to competing. Just like kanaka, yeah? It's a good... It's a good symbol for how we should act, yeah? Growing next to our neighbors or those around us, feeding them um, and not taking um, as much as we feed. And so everything about haloa symbolizes the ohana from the way it grows to the way it sacrifices for its keiki when the, the makua ages um, to the way that, that it... So kalo, when you make poi, we know about the protocol of when the poi bowl is open and, and we change our, our thought processes and our talk story topics um, to become more le'a le'a, right? Nothing, no swearing, um, no, no anger, no aggression, no holding on to stuff inside of you. It's all le'a le'a, all joyful. And that's because the texture of poi is what? Sticky, yeah. So that sticky concept of poi is really important with regards to family too. Because poi and, is sticky, it also has the power to bind together, Yeah. It has the power to bind our ohana together um, through the entire process, through preparation of aina, through kanu of kalo, through um, mulching, watering, um, into the process of huki and cooking in the imu, in the kahumuai, and, and, and the kui of kalo. It is in it, the whole thing is a family process. So if you're not involving your family in that, you're really missing out on the most beneficial part of what halo can provide to us. We can skip this. This is just one of our kalo trials that we did with some of the varieties. This is what it looks like when it starts. Um, I'm 6'2". Some of the kalo, this was at um, five months. The kalo peaked a little bit higher than this. I don't know if you can see. It's like a Where's Waldo um, little head in that kalo patch. But um, yeah, at its, peak, at its peak, the kalo peaked out at six foot eight inches. And that's just from um, ancestral practices, no fertilization. Um, yeah, but we can skip that. All right. The way I was taught to identify Kahlo from Uncle Jerry. Before that, um, I classified Kahlo in two categories. Yeah, my categories were purple and green. Yeah? Oh, what, color, what, what, what variety of Kahlo? Who are you growing? And I say, oh, I grow a green one. Yeah, oh. <laughs> Uncle Jerry just cringed like, oh, green one. I was like, yeah, green one. He's like, oh. Okay. So let's see, that could be one of maybe 300 varieties. So I was like, huh? He's like, yeah. I was like, okay. So when he started training me, we would be in the mala. I remember being on Oahu, and we were in the mala, and we were approaching the mala. And from here to where um, Brother Yuri is in the back, by the ava plant, he would say, who's that? And I would say, hmm, I don't know, looks like maybe lau loa. He's like, oh, why is that? I would say, well, I see the leaf. It's real sagittate, real arrowhead looking. He stands real tall, real cool with his chest out. Okay, my kai. We take one step forward. And as we take that step forward, he'll tap me on the shoulder and he'll say, one step only. Who's that? I'm like, oh, maybe lau loa keo keo. he say, oh, why is that? And I'll say, well, I can see the, the color of the ha is a little bit, little bit darker green, um, but not as dark as our, our other Lauloa families. I go, okay, my kai, he steps forward, one more step. Now who's that? And as we get closer and closer, I was narrowing it down more and more to the point where we got to that kalo plant. I have identified over 40 descriptors that tell you who that kalo is. Um, and if you're worried, if, if you don't know what descriptors are, um, think of it as, as yourself, right? All of you are classified by different traits that you have. I could describe to someone when I'm talking to someone and they don't know who I'm talking about. I'll say, you know, the, the real tall guy, long hair, this color eye, right, this color skin, um, that's one way to classify them. So traits are important to identify color. But more than the trait in order to identify your color variety is also the name. Because if you don't know the name of the color, then a lot of that symbolism is lost, yeah? So you say, okay, Traits identify you, your name identifies you, where you come from identifies you, right? When I asked you to introduce yourself today, you all said 
your name and where you're from. All of our color have a place that they're from. And so when we're identifying these color varieties, it's important to know who they are, what they look like, who they like to grow next to. These names hold kauna within them. Kauna is a multi-layered symbolism. Yeah? When your parents named you, I hope it wasn't as simple as throwing open a dictionary of names and pointing to one. I hope there was more intention behind it. Um, in Hawaii, that's how we name things. We layer it with symbolism. All of my kids, in one section of one of their names, I can lay out seven different reasons why they hold that name. There's that many layers of symbolism in it. And when I say their name, it's all-encompassing of all of that symbolism, not just one portion of it, right? Same with our color. So um, the descriptors are, are not that complicated. There's a picture of the poster here. If you ever want to, to get a picture of this, it's also in, also in the book, um, Taro Malka Tumakai. It's also online on Google. And all it does is break down some of the parts. Now, this is not all the things that will classify a kalo. Some kalo look exactly the same. And then when you cook it, one comes out off-white and one comes out pure white. And every other trait is the same. And that's the only thing that classifies them as different. Or they're entirely the same, but the maka patterns on the corm are different. One goes spiraled down the corm, one goes every other. Par parallel alternate, we call it. Some are in straight lines, like our pikols. The makas are straight down. Um, what does that maka shape look like? So we have the lau, the leaf. From far away, I'm already assessing, does this kalo have good posture or bad posture like me? Yeah? Does it stand up real straight and tall like our lau laws and our maninis? Is it a little more relaxed like our kais, yeah? our mois? Or is it real short to the ground and real stocky like our apu, apuai, pi'eli'i, pa'akai, api'i? Yeah? Where they stand real low to the ground and they catch the water with their leaves. And so I'm already assessing the stance from the second I see that kalo plant. And then as you get closer, you can start to break down the lau, the ka'e lau, the edge of the leaf, the shape of the lau, yeah? Arrowhead, sagittate, or real round, ovate, like a tire, like haokea, iliuawa. Yeah? And then I'm looking at the pico. What color is that pico? Is it small? Is it big? Does it spread into the primary Y veins? Does it spread into the secondary Y veins? I'm looking at the surface of the lau, kealo o kalau, I'm looking at the sinus cut in the middle, yeah, that little V shape. Yeah? I'm looking how deep it cuts. I'm looking at the lobes, those little ear lobes you see. Yeah? This is the face of Kamapua. You can see the ear lobes. Are the ear lobes acute or obtuse? Yeah? Are they, are they, you're, looking, you're trying to process everything you see about that color just from the surface. Then you look at the back of the leaf where the ha meets the lau. What does that color look like? Is that whole stem that color or is half the stem that color? Looking at the ha, is it one color, two color, three color? Does it have stripes? Does it have speckles? Does it have um, smearings on it, like our lolo palakea? Palakea means to smear. Does it go from green to light purple to dark purple to black? Um, and then you're looking inside the ha, and you see these webbings inside the ha. What color is the webbing? What color is the background of the webbing? You're looking at the cocoa color. You're looking at um, the kohina, where the ha meets the i'o. Yeah, the stem meets the underground stem. By the way, don't call the kalo, don't call that a root. It's an underground stem. I get a little frustrated sometimes. Um, also, don't say pounding poi. That's another thing that gets to me. This, this is just a side note. Um, that's not a, pounding poi is not a thing. It is not poi until you bring it off your board and in your bowl. Um, so if you're pounding poi, you're wasting your time because it's already poi. Um, you can say kui kalo. That's good. Kui kalo is good. Don't say pounding poi. Um, also, don't call that a root, yeah? That's an underground stem, technically. Uh, and and um, the, the lateral things coming off the side, those little hulu hulu, those are roots, okay? Um, every part of the color is, is, is consumable, including the roots. I have a friend who makes dishes with the root. And the roots are edible. The i'o, yeah, the color makes um, poi, ai pa'a, um, or any stage of that, yeah? From pa'i ai to, to holo ai. Um, the, the ha is edible, the flower is edible, the leaf is edible. Yeah, it's all knowing how to cook them and what to do with it, um, but they're all edible. So without this plant, our kupuna would not have survived in Hawaii when they first arrived here. And it wouldn't have sustained, they wouldn't have been able to grow the lahui to the point that it was when foreigners first came. And it's an amazing plant. It's grown all around the world. It's not our plant necessarily, but we have a very unique origin story and connection to it. It's grown from ancient Egypt 
um, through all of Asia, through all the, the Pacific, even into Africa. Kalos consumed as a main starch in, in all those areas. So, okay, better switch because I know we're short on time. So, I'm going to give you a glimpse of some of the ohana. And these posters, you don't have to look up here, they're behind you as well. Um, these are not all the kalo that we have in Hawaii. These are just all I could fit on these posters and all I could afford at the time. And still, no, nah, no. Nah. Um, so, yeah, these are just, you know, like Kanaka, kalo were placed in ohana. Ohana, you can come sit on these chairs in the front if you guys want. Yeah, okay. So, kalo were placed into ohana. And a lot of these ohana have disappeared since... Um, since when, when foreigners came, they introduced pests, diseases, um, commercial, commercialization of our crops, and, and then all of our varieties started to disappear because um, two, two varieties were preferred above everything else. But um, Kalo have ohana. They grow in ohana just like us. This is the ohana manna. The ohana manna is characterized by one corm having multiple ha off that same corm. Not oha, but makua. If you look up here, It's like your hand with the mana mana limas coming off of it, right? That's how it gets its name. Um, another way to classify your mana, because the manas don't always mana, they don't always branch out, is if you look at the mana ulu on the far right, those makas grow three, sometimes four makas all in a row, smashed together. So if, you're, if you don't know if you're growing a mana, look for the maka pattern, and you'll see them smashed together in a short little um, thing right there. Um, mana opelu. I was in Ka'u doing a Ku'i Kalo demonstration and we had a kupuna in the back. And when we brought up Mana Opelu, he sat up in his seat and his eyes lit up. Yeah, old time fisherman from Milolii. And I said, Uncle, you know this Kalo? And he goes, Oh, yeah. I said, Uncle, who's this Kalo? He's like, Oh, that's, that's the one we use for the Palu, for the Opelu. I was like, no way, you use them for the bait. He's like, yeah, we bait the fish with that one. I said, oh, okay. He said, that's the best bait. Right? Nowadays, people use squash and sweet potato, and this is the best, the opelu come. And then speaking to other kupuna in Milolii, they were offended by me asking about bait and fishing because to them, this concept of fishing is a foreign concept. They don't call what they do fishing. They don't call it What they refer to it as is, is hanai. And hanai means to feed. It also means to adopt, to take care of, to raise. Hanai means to feed. And they go out with all of this mana opelu and they just feed the opelu without even the thought of bringing fish back. They'll paddle all the way out in their canoe, just drop the bait and feed. Then when it's time for the fish to give back, they paddle out and they keep the bait in the va'a, in the canoe. And what you think happens? The fish jump in. And so rather than fishing, right, it's this concept of reciprocity. When we give to the environment and to others around us, in return, that is the natural state of who we are, of who these fish and animals and plants are. So it's a different concept, right, than that foreign concept of I'm going to go out there and catch all I can and chop it up and sell it for top dollar. It is, I'm going to go feed them. And when I need, I know they're going to feed back. Yeah? Mana opelu. Yeah? The original bait for the opelu. Um, we're going to talk about mana ulu we have outside. I, I saw some dashes at the ano, the variety you brought today. So uh, mana ulu, like, I told my kids don't have favorites because you're not supposed to have favorites when you're like Kalo ID people, right? You're not supposed to. And... Um, because Uncle Jerry's response every time is like, oh, what's your favorite kalo? And he would always, his response was always the one in my bowl on my table. And it's true. I've still never met a kalo I didn't like as well. And so, but Mana Ulu is one of my kids' favorites. She always calls it out. I'm like, man, be quiet. Like, um, just because it kui is so nice. Like, all the pu'us get out real easy, the bumps when you, when you kui. Real ulika, real good flavor. It looks like the ulu, the poi ulu from the ulu tree. Um, that's how it got its name. Um, our pico ohana, yeah, we talk a lot about that. Our, our pico ohana is our wind tolerant kalo variety. And that's because as the wind comes, it rips the leaf and rips the leaf and rips the leaf. And so the kalo just 
kahulis, it mutates to have that rip as it grows. And then it grows this sharp um, kua, this sharp ridge on the back to hold it firm in the wind. And when the wind blows, it can kind of maneuver better than a regular kalo leaf. Um, the whole piko ohana has variant names. Instead of piko, I could say hai hai ua ua, hai hai ula ula, hai hai uli uli, hai hai keo keo, hai hai kea, hai hai ele ele. Yeah? These are all names that I could switch them with. And that's because um, the variant name for piko is hai hai. And when you know the language, it opens up the mana'o to your brain as to why these, these varieties are called that. Hai, yeah? Anyone know what the hai Hawaii is? The flag. The flag whipping in the wind. Not just the flag itself, but that flag whipping in the wind. Anyone know what kawaii hai means? To the point where it's whipping. To the point where, have you been at Kauai Hai where the, that makani is like taking your face off because there's sand in it? Yeah? Yeah, I have too. Um, and Hai Hai refers to that whipping wind, refers to this variety being wind tolerant. Okay, brother, we got to switch. Kalamai, we got to get going. We could talk story after too if you guys are around. Um, we have our Ula Ula Ohana, which is not, there's, there's evidence that shows that these were all their individual Ohanas there was a whole pony ohana, yeah? There was a whole kumu ohana. But as we lost these varieties, we, sh we smashed them together so they could still be an ohana, but they're not... Um... Anyway, ula ula kumu is named after the fish, the kumu fish that has a white stripe. It's that veke-looking goat fish. Um, this color gets white stripes on occasions. Ula ula moano is a, is a good, a good um, example of color having different names Sometimes even in the next Ahupua'a, but definitely on every other island. Uh, Ula Ula Moano got its name on this island, that's what we call it. And it's named after the Moano fish that induces dreams, yeah, if you eat the brain. Um, but it also has the name from, if you go to Maui, they call this variety Ahu Ula. After the capes, the Maui chiefs had green and red in their capes, yeah. If you go to Kauai, they call it Ie Ie which has the stripes and the coloring of the ie ie vine on the ha. Um, our, ele, our ula ula pony, famous for uh, making dai for kappa. Our ele ele ohana, yeah, famous. This is royal, uh, royal kalo. Um, two of at least 10 kalo that we know of that makes red poi. And most often, if your poi fermented red, and you guys will ku it and be like, ah, oh, kaiana, this guy lied to me. Thing is dark pink, it's not, it's not red. Well, we have found over 17 words for fresh poi. And they all have English connotations to bland, insipid, tasteless. Kanaka, we did not eat fresh poi traditionally. Yeah? Today you get it from the store and it's sour, you go back and complain. Yeah? Some of you, not all of you. Actually, all of you are probably pretty ma. But um, you know, I know my grandparents would. They didn't like, they liked the fresh poi. The generation before them was a generation that had all the, that was ma'a to the fermented poi, um, which is where the best medicines and, and are, are available. And so you wait for that, that poi to poha, to ferment, to hu, when it rises. Yeah, it gets the cotton candy on the top, yeah? That white, beautiful cotton candy, you mix that in, and um, then it turns red. And that was kapuali'i. Um, if your poi doesn't bite you when you bite it, it's not ready. Yeah? You got to put them back in and let the thing... Yeah? And another caution is if your poi poha, if it ferments and that mold on the top is not white and fluffy, if it's green, red, or black, or anything in between, then it was contaminated. Don't eat it. The white is the one you want. Okay? So you can scrape that green, black part off and then mix the white in. Yeah, but um, that means that whoever kui that kalo had dirty hands. So, our manini ohana. The manini ohana were named after the manini fish. They have stripes on them. And the manini fish was used to, to appease the nini of, of your akua or your kupuna. If you, if you did something in life and you knew that embarrassed your god or your ancestors, then you better make an offering to nini, yeah, to, to, to that nini, to the anger, to appease that anger. And if you didn't have the fish because you lived up uka, you could use this variety of kalo. But a lot of our kalo have fish names. 
A lot of them have names that we know them by, but a lot of them have alternate names that have fish forms, fish names. And you know, one day we were reading the Mo'olelo of um, Naiole, where he grabs Kamehameha and he runs up to here, Kohala, and he hides uh, Kamehameha in the mountains, and it says Kamehameha was raised on a specific food. Anyone know what food he was raised on? Nope. That's not what it says, at least. He was raised on Kai'aivi Ole. Kai'aivi Ole. The fish with no bones. And at first thought, you're like, that's smart. Like, he's going to be a chief. It was prophesied. Take the bones out of the fish so he doesn't choke. Makes sense. And then you start to realize, wait, all of our kalo have fish names. And all of our kalo turn into poi, fish with no bones, right? And so Kamehameha was not raised on fish from the ocean. He was raised on the fish with no bones. And um, you were right, it is poi. It doesn't say that specifically, but you have to kind of vehe that mana'o a little bit and know that they weren't talking about you know, actual fish with no bones. He was raised on poi. Okay, we can hold him more this. Our Laulua Ohana, this is one of the few Ohana that will tell you exactly what you're looking at. Yeah, not much kauna necessarily, exactly what you're looking at. Laulua means long leaf. All of this family has a long leaf. The second name will tell you what the color of the ha will be. So palakea means to smear. It'll go from green to purple. The keo keo has the lightest color green ha. Ula, I mean ele ele is the black ha. And then that last one will give you a descriptor of what the lihi, that edge on the ha will look like. Okay, so laulua palakia ele ele, the laulua long leaf plant that has that color smeared on it with the ele ele stripe on the, on the lihi. Super simple. This is um, color identification for dummies. Yeah, real easy, 101. Um, if you don't know how to identify it, you could just look at a dictionary and know who you're looking at. Yeah. Then there's some real interesting ones like avel vel. So if you didn't know, the natural state of color is in, in the wild is to send runners out. Yeah, but uh, could you go back to the to the previous poster with um with just the kalo parts on it? Yeah, there we go. So I'm gonna take this off and walk. So if you look here, these are called oha. Yeah, they're suckers. The, like domesticated kalo will have these. When you take it back to the wild, pretty quickly they start to throw these things we call runners, stolons, jumping jacks, rhizomes, whatever you want to call it, and it will it will send that out, and that's because kalo. In, in its wild state, it's a more efficient form of traveling, right? It's easier to find sunlight, to find nutrition, to find somewhere that's not compacted, to find moisture, if it's running around. But you don't want that doing it in your mala. But Avel Vel is one variety that we call our wild kalo that runs like that in the forest. And initially, you can go back to the picture um, of the slide. Initially, when we had, when we had found Avel Vel, we're like, well, this color isn't red, like the alvelvel fish. It's green. So why did we call it alvelvel? Why did our kupuna name it that? And so I went into the ocean and decided to kilo to observe this fish in, in, its, in its habitat. And I watched this fish in the daytime. In the daytime, this fish hangs out with the uu. A lot of you call it minpachi. And that uu and the alvelvel will come out of the cave and look around, big eyes, and come back in. And then come back out, real sketchy, like look around, come back in. Yeah? And then I realized, oh, okay, this is our wild kalo. It hides in the crevices and caves of our forest. And on occasion, he will peek his head out for you. And that's exactly what this kalo did. It peeked its head out for me just one time, and I was able to find it. Um, but it hides real well in the forest. Our elepao ha uliuli, elepao ha kea. And we have an elepao sister called elepao, well, you know. Um, they, in the Bulletin 84 book, if you guys don't have that resource, I would suggest you download it, Bulletin 84, if you're identifying your color. It's from Bishop Museum. It's an old document. It is a little bit flawed, but, you know, it's the best we have. Um, we have Kupuna actively working on the revision of it. Um, Elipayo, in that book, says it was named after the bird, the Elipayo bird. But that's problematic because it says it, it's named after the bird because the, white, the Elipayo bird has white spots under its wings. Um, and it doesn't in Hawaii, on this island. The Oahu, I think, Elipao, one of the Elipaos have spots under its wings. 
So that name was problematic. And then one of my friends from Oahu was like, you know what the Elipayo is, right? And I was like, oh, I don't know what it is. And he said, um, look up. We were out in Maui. And he's like, look up. We were in Hana. Hana, no, but the star is bright, kind of like Javi. We look up, and he said, that's the Elipayo. That's it, our word for the Milky Way. And Elipayo has these spots on its leaf, these white spots. If you can't see it, you can look on the posters in the back. And it's a reflection of that lani, that leva, that sky, the Milky Way on the surface of the leaf, yeah? Um, there's your Pololu, famous in, in um, Kohala. Pico Kea was famous in Kohala. Apu was famous in Kohala. But, um, yeah, Pololu, it's a really fun one to kui. If you guys are ever bored, that would be a fun, yeah. And if you're ever even more bored, throw in a, a, a random variety with Pololu and you'll never get the bumps out, I promise. Um, okay, you can switch. This is some of our royal reds, which is what we call our, our ohana of kalo that ha make red poi. It's not a traditional name. It's just something we made up out of nowhere. Um, these are our short, stocky kalo that have crinkly lau. Um, apu, apu wai, they catch the, the vai from, from the lani, yeah? And it was one of the most sacred waters on earth. I would say second to Lake Waiau on Mauna Kea, Mauna Wakea. This kalo was, I mean, this vai was sacred because it had not yet touched the earth. We call it the vaiha ule ole, the water that has not yet fallen to the earth. And it made the most potent medicines. Um, nowadays, you cannot consume it as much because um, slugs have been introduced to Hawaii and um, they have diseases and rat lungworm and stuff. Kalo pa'akai, uh, by the way, the apu and apuai kalo make like the craziest best luau. Low calcium oxalate, not very much itchy crystals in it that you have to cook down. And it just has this buttery flavor to the luau. It's onno. Kalo pa'akai, one of our few kalo we know for sure is salt tolerant. Um, our kupuna site adapted these varieties to, to Hawaii. And, you know, they bring the first kalo from Kahiki and they'd plant it on the, on the, the kai. And then they'd take it up to, say they brought it to Keokaha, because everyone thinks, you know, wherever you're from, you always think the first Hawaiians landed there. And um, so say they brought it to Keokaha, it would look very similar to what it looked like in Kahiki. And then they take that kalo variety and they plant it up in Ola'a, yeah, what they call um, Mountain View, yeah, volcano area, or even Ka'ana, um, that they call Curtis Town. You plant it there. It takes on a whole new trait. Yeah, just like me, when, when I was planted in Ola'a, I took on new traits. I gained more weight. Yeah? I turned more white. I wasn't seeing the sun as much. I was in an Ohi'alehu forest. Our color are the same way. They take on new traits as you move them across the island. And you take me from Ola'a, you put me in, in Ka'u, in, in the desert of Ka'u. Oh, sunburn, I come, right? Different color on my skin. I look different. I'm in the Ka'i more. I'm getting skinnier. Um, take me to Kona. Plant me in the Pohaku. All new traits. Take me to up here in Kohala, Kohala Mountain Road. Big Makani. All new traits. Yeah. And that's how we get our varieties in Hawaii. It's called somatic mutation. Um, in Hawaii, we call it kahuli. Uh, there is a way to pollinate and cross um, kalo varieties, but there's good evidence that our kupuna didn't do that very often, um, just because of how close the gene pool is when we genetically, uh, when we genetic sequenced our kalo varieties, the DNA strands came back too close to be cross pollinations. They were all somatic mutations. All right, next. Okay. We'll talk about just two more, and then we'll have to um, transition, I think. We'll get some questions. Uh, all right, Lihi Lihi Molina. This variety, I was, in, I was in the archives, and we found Queen Emma's journal, and she wrote about this variety as, as one of her favorites. And this variety was gone for a long time, and then it showed up at a, um, a hui kalo in Hilo that Uncle Jerry was putting on, and a kupuna had it. And he was able to, to malama that variety. And I was, I was reading a document sent to me by one of my aunties. And, and in this document, it had this, this unnamed author that wrote in the, I think it was the La Pepa, uh, the New Paper Ku'oko'a. And that's the Hawaiian language newspaper from old. And this lady was writing, like kind of a promiscuous kind of a lady. She was writing about all of these men she loved. And, and, and cherished in her life. 
And she was naming these names that I was like, wow, I've never seen these names before. These are beautiful Hawaiian names for men. And she starts listing these names off. And she talks about this one guy who's like, wow, he's so tall, he was so handsome. One who, um, one who was a little bit short, a little bit fatter. And then she gets to this name about this man who had the longest, most beautiful eyelashes. And his name was Lihilihi Molina. And then it hit me. This kupuna is not talking about guys that she loved in her life. She's talking about kalo varieties, her favorite kalo varieties. But if you didn't know that, you would have thought she was speaking about her like romantic lovers. And so it, it, highlight, it highlighted a few things to me. The main thing that it highlighted to me was that our relationship with food is much different than the relationship our ancestors had with food. Um, they had very intimate, close relationships with, with their plants. And they treated them, um, she was writing about them like a human. That's why when I ask you, I won't ask you what variety you grow. I will ask you, who do you grow? Because we, we treat them like what we want them to become. Yeah? And you know that, that term, ha loa, is an interesting term. Ha means stem, loa means li, um, long, to elongate the stem. But ha loa, when, when people walk around and they say, I am Hawaii, you are, we are ha loa as well. Not just because we descend from him linearly, right? Not just because we can trace our ancestry back to him. Not just because without him, we wouldn't be able to exist here in Hawaii. But also because when we consume ha loa, it gives us ha loa. The other definition of ha is breath. As we consume these ancestral foods, we live longer. We, it literally gives us longer breath. And so it's important to remember that as you're going about you know, eating, eating the things that you intend them to be um, is important. Wahia pele. Wahia pele, there's a, a uala variety called wahia pele. There's a coal variety called wahia pele. And it translates as the smoke of pele. And if you look at this kalo, it's pretty easy to see why they named it that. Um, but the kauna is really revealed when that sun is rising above the horizon or setting. And that sun, kala, is shining from the back of the low. And you see that light come through the low. And if you've ever been on hale ma'uma'u at the lua pele, and you've seen that wahi, that smoke of pele covering the sky, it looks exactly like when that sun is rising and shines through the back of that leaf. Um, the kalo also makes a smoky gray colored poi. I have even tasted it as smoky when it wasn't cooked in the imu. And we thought that, okay, that's cool. That's the extent of the kauna that our kupuna put in there. I had sent um, part of the collection of kalo to a good friend um, in what we refer to as Leilani Estates now. And this was before um, the pele came down to, to visit Leilani. What, four Years ago, I don't, I don't know. COVID threw a wrench in my timeline. I don't remember. Um, but yeah, anyway, when that lava came down, it was wiping out everything. I had, we went to help them move out. And like, wow, these guys, Puna guys is different, you know. It sounded like a jet engine. What, what they refer to as fissure eight sounded like a jet engine. Just lava just like flying out of it. And um, his backyard went right up to fissure eight. And we get there and, you know, I'm like, bro, let's get moving. We're wearing gas masks. But they, they bust out their beach chairs. They sit down, they open the cooler, they start drinking. They're starting the grill. I'm like, what is, like, Puna guys is different. Like, I was like, okay, I'm going to load up the truck and get out then because um, they were just comfortable in that scene. Um, but how did we get there? Wahia Pele. So we, should, we go there to help him move everything out, and just everything is dead. It looks like someone sprayed poison on all the plants. The trees lost all their leaves. Um, the sulfur dioxide, the SO2, had killed everything. Hapu ferns, dead. Avocado trees, dead. Um, ulu, dead. Everything dead. And I come around the corner to his backyard. Everything is just grass, dead, except for one plant. What plant do you think that was? Our, our only SO2 tolerant kalo that we know of. Mana Ulu was doing okay too. But, um, so when you talk about site adapting these kalo varieties and the kauna, the symbolism laced in these names, we're not even scratching the surface of who these kalo are. Um, and with that, 
I think it's important that we answer your questions. I know some of you had very specific questions, so I'm going to transition into a Q&A period, then we'll take a break, then we'll dive into Ava. Are we running behind a little bit? Okay. Yeah, that mic, that mic should be good. Um, if, folks, if folks do have questions, please come up to the mic just so that we can capture them and everybody can hear them, please. And I'll start with a quick question. I wonder if you might speak just very briefly. I know there's a lot to probably include, but um, just some hands-on knowledge around planting the kalo, maintaining the kalo, harvesting the kalo, just so folks could maybe leave here today with a little bit more insight into that. And I also will share that we were very fortunate to have Ka'iana work with us on a video series that Hip Agriculture produced last year. Um, and he did a very in-depth uh, video with us. It's about 25 minutes on planting, maintaining, harvesting kalo. And I'll share that link with all of you after today's workshop. So. Yeah, mahalo. So, yeah, your planting method will be determined by where you live. If you have soil, if you don't have soil, if you have pohaku, um, it, it, will, it will vary. So there's multiple methods. We were just talking last night about some of these methods uh, with um, our friend and, and Dash. And we, we talked about a few methods called kipi-kipi, which is a very Hilo-centric method of these long, tall mounds that they would grow on because Hilo is saturated. You, you want to keep your kalo out of the saturation. A lot of people think, oh, well, kalo loves water, so I'm going to stick it in this muck. If that water is not flowing, your kalo will rot. It will rot in that ground. Um, you also can't do a flowing and then have it go dry and then flowing again um, because every time it goes dry, your corn will suck in and then go back out. If you pull out your, your eo and it looks like the hourglass, yeah, or the old Coke bottle, yeah, that's because your kalo experienced drought beyond what it was capable of enduring. And so um, I would say that, that, yeah, mimic that. Find out the traditional planting method of where you were growing kalo. Kohala has a weird one. And it's weird because I've never been able to verify it. But it's probably, there's a reason behind it. But there's a method in Kohala that I read about where Kohala people would, would start their kalo up in the, oh no, they would set it by the kai, by the ocean. And then midway through their cycle, they dig up the whole plant and take it up mocha and replant it and let it finish maturing up there. So I don't know, I would, I, I'm very curious to see why that was. Um, because when you disturb kalo, it doesn't really love it. But yeah, that's, that's a kohala method. Um, I talked about kipi kipi long rows. There's pu'e pu'e style, these mounded hills in the lo'i where water is not abundant. Um, to, to adjust for the influx of water and the loss of water, you just mound them up. So the roots have access to the water, but the corm, the eel is not sitting in that water and then losing it. Um, mala style, uh, people call it, we talked about maka lua. Um, there are... We call it pakeke style. It's not a real style, but it's just you dig the lua as big as a five-gallon bucket, stick the huli in the bottom of that, and you can grow five-gallon size um, kalo. Um, you have places where, you know, we were talking about one of the uncles in Kona who uh, would walk and throw huli on the ground. He was in the pohaku side of Kona where it's dry. And he'd throw the huli on the ground, kick a few rocks, specific rocks over that huli, and he would get softball-sized kalo, Yeah. And, and so it's all about knowing. And the reason why is because he said that when that, a certain wind would come, it would catch the rocks and drop down to feed his kalo. And those pohaku, those rocks, would act as sponges and regulators of moisture. The rocks will suck up moisture in the evening, in the dew, and then slow release that moisture to the kalo in the daytime when it's blazing hot. Yeah? And our friend was telling me, he's like, yeah, we went Kauai High, we picked up pohaku in the desert of Kauai High, and there was moisture under these rocks. And so um, there's, there's the pahala planting method in Kalapanna and Ka'u where they, they chop the hala trees down, let them on fire, plant the huli right on the ash, and then re-chop hala as mulch. There's the pakukui method in Kamakua, famous in Hamakua. Dig big pits, bury all of their kukui leaves, mound it with soil, and then you go back two or three months later, you pull out the stem, if the leaves are still attached to that, that kukui, you leave it a few, a few more months. When you pull that branch out and all the leaves are gone, you cut your kalo, and it's the biggest kalo I've ever seen. Um, and good quality kalo. Kukui is the best medicine for kalo. Um, there's, there's tons of methods. Moloka'i, Lana Kapapa, we were talking about last night. Moloka'i, they would make rafts of hau, mound the muck of the hau bush on that raft in their lokoi and their fish ponds, and plant the kalo on these floating rafts. Kind of like the, the Aztec um, chinampas we was talking about. I think chinampa. Yeah. 
Um, okay, but those are just some planting methods that, that honestly, just planting in the ground and throwing mulch is fine too. Um, sometimes we overthink it, but you know, it's cool to realize that there was a reason they chose those planting methods for those locations, yeah. Um, okay, if you have a question, hand the mic to the mic. Ask it. I'm sorry you have to walk up to ask it, but yeah, ask a question and then we can, we can talk about it. Aloha, I'm David. Uh, my question is about uh, pest management. I know that like when you hookie the kalo, you do like a, like a bleach bath or like a dawn soap where you'll dip the huli after. And so when you're carrying the huli, you don't have the bugs on them. Yeah. But once you plant the huli, like at your hale, yeah. and then you know, say the aphids start coming around and you don't want to spray poison, okay. what, what kind of solutions can you do? Good question, yeah. So you talked about one method of sanitizing huli before you even plant it. So if you don't have kalo at your house yet, this is a good time to make sure that anything you bring in is sanitized. The 10% bleach dip he was talking about is maikai, if, if you're okay with bleach. Um, and always throw a little bit of Dr. Bronner's soap in there because fire ants can float, and fire ants is a thing right now on, on this island. Um, there's also a hot water dip that you'll find in that book, Taro Malkatu Makai, where you just give it a hot water dip at a certain temperature. To me, that's a waste of gas, um, but you can do that. And then there's the, and those are preventing things like Phytophthora, the leaf blight, pocket rot, um, dealing with pests like aphids, leafhoppers, the delf acids, even down to fire ants, slugs. Um, you can also do a kai soak. And with the kai soak, you strip your huli down to the last ha, you pull all of them, you wrap them in pull all those in bundles, and you take your, your tro net out with you to the kai. And that tro net, you want the ones with a little bit bigger makas, a little bit bigger weights. And you throw your tro net out over the, the huli, and it sinks the huli to the bottom of the kai, of the ocean. You let your kids out kai, let them play. A few hours later, you pull that huli in, and it's completely sanitized. The tides shift and wash all of your huli off, and nothing survives that. So, um, Now, if you planted your kalo and there's pests in it already, um, the hardest way to do it would be to do a knee oi, Hawaiian chili pepper, mixed, blended with water, added, add neem oil and a little bit of soap. Um, and you'd have to spray every leaf in every ha on every plant. And that's ridiculous. People do it, but it's ridiculous. Um, the better way to do it is Ike Kupuna that I learned from, I think it was Handy. It might be Tutupuku'i. Um, where, and I've done this many times, so you just got to trust. You got to have faith. That's the thing. You got to have faith because it, it seems counterproductive to do it, but it's not. You plant all of your kalo in the ground, all of your huli. Plant them deep, at least a third in the ground. And then you wait. The first leaf will come out. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, nani. Second leaf will come out. Oh, nani. Third leaf will come out. As that third leaf comes out, you stack all of your lao malo, all of your dried leaves around the patch. Your maia, your dried banana leaf, your dried ulu leaf your dry new fronds, your dry uluhe fern, your dry hapu'u fern, any kind of dry leaf material you stack around your garden. And then you wait a few more hours for the leaf hoppers to come back and feel comfortable. And then you ho'a. You light that whole patch on fire, safely if you can do it. And you'll burn your whole kalo patch to the ground. And it will kill every single pest, fungus, and disease that exists. And then your kalo will grow back. And you'll start to see these green, slimy little slugs coming out of the ground everywhere. And they will grow bigger and more vigorous than you've ever seen your color grow. Because now they have extra fertility, right? All that potash, all that ash is available now. And there's zero pests. And so it takes a little bit of faith because, you, you know, even like when I used to do it, I only had one of this variety. But the leafhoppers were whacking them. And so I was like, okay, light them on fire. Sure enough, they all came back. Healthy, healthy plants. So... To me, that's the easiest way to do it. And because you guys live in an area where you get plenty of rain, I would, that, I would feel safe recommending that, that method. Um, it works the best every time. You can sanitize the entire patch one time. Yeah. Uh, the hoolies, just before planting, yeah. have you ever dipped it in ash and then planted? No. Have you done that? I don't know what it does, but 
My father used to do that, you know, a long time ago. He, when he used to plant rooted stuff, he used to dip it in ash. Huh. Of course, the ash is cold, yeah? And when you think about it, some of the fungus, you know, adhere some of the fungus, but yeah. yeah. Less pocket rot, yeah. Good idea. Okay, there we go. That's why I love these events. That's Ike Kupuna right there. Um, yeah, dip it in ash. I know our ava, we've, we've dipped in aloy, the ava nodes to crust the ends, yeah, to scab them over, but um, dipping in ash is a good idea. Mahalo for that, uncle. Any other questions you want to ask before we transition? And this is not the end. You can talk to me the rest of the day, too. You can just ask questions, but um, there's so much. Like, we could have did a six-hour, eight-hour class just on Kalo, but we're trying to, like, condense it because you guys all have lives. Um, um, we can do it outside uh, after this, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we'll show you a few ways to cut huli. Uh, there's many ways to do it, but a few options you have. Um, mahalo, Dash, appreciate it. But yeah, we'll do, do that outside later. Uh, any other questions that you guys have? Are you more confused now than you were when you came here? Good, you should be. That's even me. Like when I think I know, I realize I don't know. You know, I get to the mala, I'm like, wow, you look different than you did last season. I grew you, and that's okay too. Color will shift and move, yeah, and look different. So it's most important to know what your color looks like in your areas. Now, with regards to harvesting, um, you know your color will be ready to harvest when it peaks out of the ground. The natural growth pattern of color is to grow itself up and out of the ground. It doesn't grow down like a taproot, like a carrot, or like some of our other crops like to grow their roots down. It will grow up and out like your banana. Um, and so you know when it's ready to harvest because your color will shrink down into a size, the leaves will get smaller, and you'll see that that eo will start to peak above the ground, the corn. You want to either do, do one of two things at that point. You want to either mound it with soil to shade that corn from the sun. Because as soon as the sun hits that corn, it will turn your starches to sugars. And it makes your color loli loli. So you want to either shade it with mulch or, or soil, or you want to harvest it. And you know you harvested your color at the right time when you pull it out of the ground and and you take your knife and you stick it in the mole, and if it goes in a little bit, it's pa'a, it's firm, it has plenty of starch inside. And if it goes in real fast, it's either loli loli, sugary, or palahe, um, rotten. And another easy way to do it is get a big bucket, fill it up with water, throw all of your corms inside, the i'o inside, and the ones that float are loli loli, the ones that sink are good to consume for poi. Yeah, the ones that float, more better you give them to your pigs, unless you like eating that crunchy, sugary, I don't know. I don't enjoy it. And you can't make poi out of it. So, um, yeah, with regards to harvesting. Yeah. Any other questions? Do they need a break? I think we're going to go straight through. Straight through. Okay. Okay, buddy, you can just... Flashbang them till we get to the Ava. It might be the next slide. We'll see. Oh, yeah, there's Wahia Pele. Yeah, with the sun coming behind it. Okay. So, um, Kupuna Ava. Now, Ava, interesting plant. Got a very bad, um, very bad rep when foreigners came here. Uh, when foreigners came here and they saw our Kupuna drinking Ava, they related it to the only beverage that they could relate anything to at that time as sailors. What was that beverage they related it to? Alcohol, yeah. Ava is nothing like and never has been anything like alcohol. Alcohol is pilau. It's terrible. I recommend none of you ever drink it. Ava is la'au, yeah? Not pilau, it's la'au. And that la'au is good for your body. Um, drinking in the right, taking in the right way um, by our traditional extraction methods of, of, of room temperature water. Yeah, when you get into the hot water extractions or the tinctures, now, now you're flirting a little bit more. Um, but this is the best way to consume it. Um, so we won't talk about everything here because we're going to have to fly through it. But um, yeah, Uncle Jerry, I learned a lot about Ava knowledge from him as well. Um, so the bowl is empty and, and he's over there by it. Um, okay, we can shift. All right, so the, the mo'olelo of, of Ava, how it was brought to Hawaii, there's, there's tons of stories of how it was brought here. Um, very, very common ones of Kane and Kanaloa bringing it with them. 
to really simplified ones of, of a bird, a manu, dropping the first node in Puna, and grew the ava lena lena, right? That ava kaula au, the ava manu, um, that famous potent yellow ava of Puna. And regardless of how it got here, we're all mahalo, it's here. So we can shift to the next. We're not going to go into these mo'olelo right now. These are some of the parts of the ava plant. There are English terms for these two, uh, from the, fu the pua, the flower, that is basically sterile, uh, to the mu'o, the new shoot, the akka, yeah, and these pu'u pu'u on the akka, the makas, those little islets that come out of the nodes that you propagate to replant your ava, to the ponna, the nodes, to the lau, to the pico and the lau of the leaf, um, to the pu or o pu ava, which is, we consume everything from, on this plant, we consume everything from this knuckle, this first knuckle, down. Anything about this first knuckle has different um, com chemotypes and components in it that are not good for human consumption. Matter of fact, that's how Germany banned Ava in the first place. Um, back in the day when Germany was like, call them Avaholics, right? They're looking for Ava everywhere they can find it. They were buying any and everything from Fiji, Vanuatu, even Hawaii. That's when we lost all of our Ava varieties. People were bulldozing into old growth forests, digging up the Ava, not replanting, selling it for top dollar to Germany. Um, when Germany banned Ava, it was because they were buying Ava from Fiji and Vanuatu that had stems and leaves dried and, and blended up with it. They were, they were just shipping everything they could to Germany. It had rust, it had pieces of metal, and then they were extracting with ethanol from that to make their tinctures for anxiety. Um, but yeah, we consume everything from here down is, is consumable. Uh, these are Niho Pua'a. It's the, Niho is teeth, Pua'a is pig. They're the pig tusks. They look like pig tusks as they come out. They're just the new shoots of Ava. Um, and then the A'a is the roots, the, the fine lateral roots that we consume. Switch. All right, so the, there's seven main descriptors for Ava. Um, the first one is the overall stance. And we're not going to talk about all the descriptors because I think you're more interested in like propagation of Ava. Um, but some stand real tall, just like the kalo. Some are a little more relaxed. Our real tall ones are like opihikau, um, mapulehu, nene, hiva. Um, they stand real tall. And then you have ones that are more relaxed, that like um, ava mo'i, pana eva. And then you have ones that are real low, like our papa, papa kea, papa ele ele pu'u pu'u varieties. Uh, we have 13 Hawaiian ava in Hawaii today. Uh, traditionally, we, there was much more than that. Okay, you can switch, switch again. All right, stem coloring. This is a, the easiest way to identify your ava is what the stem looks like. We have avas that have long internodes, uh, like this one right here. That looks like an ava hiva, real long in between the node, from node to node. One's a little bit shorter, like pana eva, and then one's real short, like papa kea, real short. Um, and, and then everything in between. And so your coloring, if there's pu'u pu'u, some ava you can be blind and still identify who they are because you can feel the bumps on them, yeah? And the prevalence of those bumps will tell you who that is. Yeah, you can switch. Okay, switch again. The pico color, there's really just two categories. There's purple picos and there's green picos. Um, so all ava are split in half depending on which variety you're, you're working with. These are additional um, descriptors that you can have, but yeah, we're, again, we're not going to focus on this. I just made the presentation long in case we had more time, but um, you, can, you can change the slide. These are some of the names of our Ava. Ava was a lot harder to identify than our Kalo. We had much less written about them that we were working with to identify. So a lot of our Ava got names after where they're from. Hanakapi Ai, yeah? Honokaneiki, uh, Mapulehu from Molokai. Honokaneiki is right around the corner. Pololu, that way, yeah. Um, Opihikau, that was found in Opihikau. Pana Eva, um, found in Pana Eva. Although it was found in other places too. Um, and they first found that variety and called it short internode green. And the kupuna in Pana Eva was like, mm, no, that's not going to fly. We're going to name it after Pana Eva. Um, and then a lot of these are, other ones are traditional names. Hiva's traditional name. Kumakua, traditional. Mahakea also goes by Maakea, um, Hakea, um, Mahakea, yeah, all, all these. Akea, there's a ton of variants for that one. Ava Mo'i for our chiefs. This is the Ava that um, Kamehameha drank 
when he wanted to strategize for war. Yeah? It, that was the one they drank on Moloka'i when they were about to go to Oahu, right? And um, a certain someone named Ka'iana wasn't invited to that party um, because of this rumor with Kahumanu, which, we, well, that's another story for another time. But um, he wasn't invited, but they had that meeting. They drank Avamo'i, they strategized. The strategy ended up being pretty good. Although Ka'iana's strategy was good too, but they just, yeah, they didn't have as many guns. Okay, switch. Yeah, we can burn through these. It's just, you just look at the beauty of some of these. That's all you're doing in these next slides for like the next 10 to 12 slides. The beautiful stripes on Honokaneiki. Honokaneiki we found recently in um, Lopohoi Nui, actually, at the top, very top of Lopohoi Nui. Yeah. Yeah, you can keep going. Mapulehu, Fala Moloka'i, Wailau. Mo'i. Beautiful, Ava. Nene, you can stop here. This is one I just gave my kids last night. I was talking to Dash. Um, my kids last night, I don't know why, we got, to, we, got, we got to Dash's place. They were going nuts. Like, they were just bouncing off the walls. So I was like, you know what? Let me just take them into the room. We go, we go make Ava for them. And um, Ava Nene is the one you give to your kids. It is the cleanest, most purest Ava we can get in terms of um, how your body digests it. Um, and... All of our kupuna said this is the one to cure the fretful child. And it's true. If my kids take a late nap or they're just bouncing off the walls and it's time to go to bed, I'll just give them one apu of avanene. Down, bird. There they are. It's really a nice thing for parents, yeah? It solves a lot of your... Um... And, you know, the thing about ava is like... And the thing about ava is that ava cures probably seven to eight different different sicknesses or issues that haoles take pills for, right? And so it's one of those things where like, we as Kanaka, we're not taking pills. And this will solve all of your issues. It's, it's in a blood circulatory, anti-inflammatory, anti-depressant, anti-anxiety. Um, it's anti-cancer. For many different cancers, the, the documents are all out from all the universities of what cancers it prevents. Not cures, but prevents. Um, there was a really interesting study done on, in Fiji um, with ava drinkers that smoked cigarettes and, um, and people who smoked cigarettes that weren't drinking ava and how there was no instance of lung cancer in those who smoked and drank ava. It, it, it prevented lung cancer from developing in their, in their lungs. Uh, prevents best breast cancer, colon cancer. There's amazing studies being published. If you're ever bored, just Google that and you'll see all the studies that, that it's produced. But yeah, go ahead. You can switch. By the way, call it ne ne, okay? Not ne ne. I said, I got a few laughs for people who know what that is. Yeah, yeah don't call it Nene. It's Nene. Okay. Avahivo. Actually, could you go back one? Brother, I'm so sorry. Opihikau. This Ava was found on a ridge in Opihikau. We're not going to tell you where. But it was found on a ridge in Opihikau by Uncle Jerry Kononui. And he was hiking and he found this along with a few other Ava plants that were different varieties but this one we didn't have. And he took some cuttings of it, brought it down, propagated it. Went back to that ridge a few months later, everything was gone. And so we almost didn't have this variety with us today. Um, but yeah, that, we named it, he named it Opihikau after where he found it. Okay, short internode green, Panaeva. Um, yeah, it, actually this one is all over the place where I'm from. It's up Kole Kole, it's up Hakalau. It's up Laupohoihoi Gulch. Still to this day, they're there. But um, yeah, this is, this is a pretty prevalent one in the wild still. Papa Ele Ele Pu'upu, beautiful plant. So this one looks like um, the one we found in Queen Lu'ukia's Ava Patch. Yeah, but they might be different, but they're pretty similar. Papa Ele Ele and Papa Ele Ele Pu'upu are good for um, any kind of issues with your bladder or kidney. They're good for urinary tract infections, yeah, um, all of that. Papakea, short internodes. This is the one that helped get me through college. Um, in college, uh, well, even before, my whole life, I was diagnosed with this thing called um, ADHD. Attention, deficit, yeah, you know what it is, yeah. 
And um, they were going to give me all these pills that I looked at the back in college and they were like, it had like, looked like a methamphetamine. I was like, what the? I said, no, thank you. So I, um, I found Papa Kea and Papa Kea found me. And Papa Kea is the one that I would drink. I'd mix my kanoa like oh, Dash did just there. Is the ava mixed? Um, feel free to uh, bring me an apu. Um, Papa Kea is the one that, that, it just helped me focus on one thing. My mind, like all the synapses are just firing on different things, but it helped me to zone in. And I would mix my kanoa, and I would um, start my 30-page my research, research paper that's due the next day with sources cited. And by the time the kanoa was empty, the paper was done. And it was the best paper I've ever written. Uh, I don't know how, but I graduated. All right, switch. Okay, these, uh, these are other species. You've got to be aware that there are ava imitators in Hawaii on the wide. A lot of people are like, hey, come see my ava. It's so big and it's spreading all over the place. I'm like, oh, wonderful. I already know it's not ava, right? I'm like, okay, I'm good. Just send me a picture. And um, if, the, if your ava is growing ridiculously fast and ridiculously vigorous, it's either invasive and not ava, or it is a two-day species that has a component in it called flavocavin B. And that component is toxic to your liver. So knowing your varieties are really important with ava, yeah? Knowing what you can consume and what you can't consume. All right, you can switch. This is a little test I did in my, in my um, high-quality lab with a bed sheet as a background and baby bottles. Um, and it's something you can all do, too. It's something you can all do. All you got to do is grab some jars, some acetone from the hardware store, and whatever ava you're consuming. And you mix... Um, I usually do... One quarter ava to three quarters um, acetone. And you can see my measurements are super accurate. Look at this guy. Yeah, that's one to four. Huh? <laughs> Close enough. But um, just extract it, and then it'll show you a color. And the, the more translucent amber your color, just like your urine, right, the healthier you are, the healthier the ava is for you. And so same as you get to this ava that my friend gave me from Aotearoa, pilau. I mean, I, don't, I would not drink that to the ava, ava isa, right, that brings that reddish brown color. Um, so all you're doing is you're just, you know, taking it easy on your liver with these, with these. All of our Hawaiian ava varieties are lighter than this, heva and lighter. So that's what they call noble ava, yeah. I, and, and it's a little ethnocentric, I understand, but Hawaii has the best of all, all the plants. Like, they really do. They did. Because if you think about it, and you're coming from... South America, or you're coming from Asia, Southeast Asia, and you're coming across the Moana Nui, you're going to bring your favorite varieties of what you like. You're going to bring the best of every variety with you. You only have so much room on a va'a. So it's going to be the best of the best. And as, you, as they go from there to, to Micronesia, into um, you know, Polynesia, Samoa, Tonga, they, let, they get to Tahiti, the, the varieties are even more refined. When they leave Tahiti to Hawaii, you're going to bring, it's going to be the best of the best. And it, there's evidence to this too. You know, as you go further back into the chain of islands, the avas become less and less pure. Um, to Papua New Guinea with Piper Wichmanii, the predecessor to Piper Methysticum that we consume, being like not even drinkable. And so, yeah, the little test you can do at home. Ava Isa, this is one that's the most prevalent ava in Hawaii, vigorous grower. It's a two-day ava. Um, yeah, you can go. Easy to identify this one. It has pubescence on the leaf. Yeah, that, that, that little fuzz. Um, and it also has really long pua, really long flowers. And the smell of it smells different too. When you crack the leaf and smell it. There's the pua. I recommend you, 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 know, you get good varieties of ava if you can sacrifice this guy. Yeah. And this is the last one we'll talk about before we end the presentation. So this ava is the most invasive species, at least in certain areas. Like when you're driving to Hana on Maui, you're going to see a whole valley taken over by invasive ironwood, whole valley taken over by invasive ohe, bamboo, whole valley taken over by this guy, and then the next two valleys are this guy's again, and then back to other invasives, right? But um, this guy will take over your whole mala, and it's really easy to tell um, this piper um, arutum, apart from Piper Methysticum, 
And by the way, these are all black pepper species. These are all piper species. So what we're drinking is, is black pepper, essentially. It's just a subspecies. Um, but all Hawaiian ava, the veins will trace back to the pico. On this variety, all the veins trace back to the midrib. Really easy to tell. And it doesn't even look like ava to me, but to some people it looks like ava. Uh, and a lot of people grow this as ava, and then they drink it, and they're like, wow, that ava was weak. It's like, yeah, that's not ava. So... Um, when you crush the low of this one, it smells like sassafras. Like, you can really tell that it's not peppermethysticum. All right, move forward. Yeah, just other piper species from Aotearoa. They drink his tea, but it's not true ava. Go ahead. Go ahead, you can skip. Um, this is one way it was traditionally propagated. They dig trenches sometimes, but this way I like where they just lay all the branches down and they put pohaku, stones, on top of it. Um, you know, a year before harvest, and then that, those nodes will take root. So when you dig up the big plant, you just cut the stems, and now you have a ring of additional ava plants already planted, and then you dig up the main one in the middle, and then those rings all grow, right? So one of the best ways, these things root really easy once they touch the ground. Oh, this is what I just did last week um, at my farm. I'm, I'm opening up this plot that we, we covered up for a while, um, Ava needs shade when it's young. This is just to show you that Ava needs shade. In Fiji, they just bend the coconut frond over it. I just was getting fancy and, um, yeah, this is one way to do it. You don't want to plant Ava next to anything that will take it over. This is Ava with coconut grown next to it. Not next to, but like far, but still yet the roots came in to suck the nutrition. The coconut, the new roots are orange. The Ava is that light colored brown and it it's a nightmare. I, I threw this guy away. It's not even worth it to me to separate the roots. You also don't want anyone that, any plants that host the root knot nematode around because that root knot nematode will decimate your ava harvest. Um, yeah, you switch. Okay. So ava we had last year during COVID at, um, oh wow, we're not wearing masks. We probably should have been wearing masks. Um, but this is a good olelo no eao that, that I love. And I found this in um, Pukui's book. It says, He kanaka kamea inu avo, he pua alaho kamea inu kuaipa. So, the person that drinks ava to heal the body, as a mahi ai, as a fisherman, as someone who works in an office, right? The person that consumes ava remains a person. Yeah? The person that consumes kuaipa, which is the transliterated word for swipe, alcohol in general, becomes a pua alaho. Yeah, you guys know what? Okay, okay, good. We got some, okay. Um, okay, Pu'alaho. It, it's, it's actually a graphic word we're not going to talk about, but, but it also is a name of a phase of Kamapua'a in our stories. He's referred to as a Pu'alaho when he's in this phase of like on the prowl, like hunting women, yeah? And, and just like, you know, going after them aggressively um, because he... He wants to mate and, and other things. And so if you think about the person who drinks alcohol, I'm sure you've seen some pua alaho in the club, right? Or in a bar. And that's how they act. As opposed to ava, which gives you clarity, brings people closer together. Yeah, we have issues in our family sometimes and we, we always solve it around the ava bowl because no, I've never seen a fight or an argument break out around an ava bowl, ever. And I've been in some diverse communities Never once. Yeah? Stark contrast to what alcohol does to your body and to your mind and your emotional state and your spiritual state and all of that. So, yeah. Okay, can switch. Some health benefits. That's my favorite. It does boost your immune system. Ava got me through COVID. It, got me through, it gets me through colds. It's the first thing I turn to to get me through any kind of a sickness. Um, it's anti-spasmatic, so muscle relaxant. If you feel fatigued, best friend of a farmer and a fisherman. Um, Antidepressant, anti-anxiety. It's not addictive. No addictive any, anything in it. You could drink ava for a month straight every night and not drink it for two months and not have any signs of withdrawals. It's just like drinking water, right? Same concept. Um, Painkiller, insomnia treatment. Those of you that can't sleep, anti-inflammatory, boost your immune system, all kinds of stuff. But um, we're out of time, so let's. Um, I'll take it. Yeah. Yeah, let's, let's get one question and then we'll, we'll, we'll close this up and we can, we can talk story after too. But I know we're, we're getting low on time. Mahalo. So, 
There's many layers of protocol for Ava when you're about to consume it um, to the very like top tier where you're spending all day in just ceremony and you get to drink the apu at the end when everyone speaks, just one apu and you go home, right? To just making it Ava Noah. And the easiest way to make it Ava Noah is you make the Ava. There's olis at Vayakane. You can do while you make your Ava. And then you're going to take your first apu and you're going to give it to your ahu, yeah? Or um, you give it to a tree or something that you want. You know, the, the, all it is is a way of honoring the aina, your kupuna, everyone that came before you first. And the, the way you make it noah is you dip one finger in and you throw it behind over your shoulder and you say, kiakaka oko. So the aka or the essence is for all of you, yeah? Your akua, your kupuna, um, everyone that's come before you. And then you say, flip one down and you say, kai oka mako. Um, the i'o, the sustenance, is for me. Yeah? And then you can hold it up, eikavayakane, and you inu. Yeah? And all that's doing is mimicking the water cycle. The whole ava process is mim mimicking the water cycle. But Adash, can you show what you're doing? So when he's, he, he strained the ava in that kanoa right there. Okay? And then there's his kanana, his strainer. Traditionally, you could use an ipu with pukas. You can use niu, ivi niu. You can use the a'a, -a, the, 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 the a'a, -a, the, what is it called? The, um, the mesh on the niu. You know that, that mesh? You can use um, whatever you have. Ahu ava was the traditional strainer, the, the, the fibers in the ahu ava plant. Uh, and um, was that? You could do that. I don't. You could do that. Um, Micronesians do that, but the vali, the slime in the hau, extracts things out of there that my body does not agree with. Yeah, we use the vali, that slime in the hau, the hau bark, uh, as a diuretic. So you can, you can do it. If you're going to do it, I would recommend drying the hau first, washing it, drying it, and using it as just fibers. But um, so what Dash is doing right now is he's 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 mixing up that kanoa, and the kanoa symbolizes. Right, that kanaloa, yeah, that whole ocean, and as he's mixing it up, the tides are flowing, yeah, and all the little ia are in there swimming around, all those little aka aka, those those fibers, and then when he picks it up, yeah, in that apu to serve, evapotranspiration, right, evaporation, now he becomes the cloud, and then he's pouring the apu into our cup, yeah, waterfalls, rain, rivers, it's mimicking the whole hydraulic cycle. Yeah, the vayakane. That's why when we inu this, we say, eika vayakane, here are the waters of kane. Kane is the, the water force. Yeah? Um, that is our scientific term for the water cycle and all things that it can do in that water cycle. And so, um, yeah, eika vayakane, and then you inu. So, ikalamai, but while we wait for the first question, I'm taking my apu. Aloha. Aloha. Um, an uncle told me once that Ava Hiva, he would drink it one night and the next night his ancestors would come to him oh. in dreams. But it's so true. Right yeah, on. it's very true. Um, yeah, mahalo for that. Ava Hiva is a dream inducer. So the way it works is that you drink Ava Hiva one night and then you take a break the next night and that night your kupuna come to visit you. Yeah. So you got to be ready for that. Um, and you know, one thing to know is that, by the way, if you're doing genealogy, if you're doing mo'oku how hao, it's a really cool way um, to get some answers to questions you don't have, right? Like in Hawaii, we have, we hit these roadblocks where you hit names with just a single name. And it's tough to get farther if you're not hitting a royal line. And so the only way to get answers to those questions is to have those kupuna come back and visit you. Otherwise, you can't connect that chain, that link. And so that's a real good way to do it. But... Again, ava, the components in ava that, that give your body relaxation or clarity are called ca kavalactones. And these kavalactones are six main ones. And every variety in every location will have a different combination of these kavalactones. And that's what affects your body. So it'll affect everyone differently. It's not like alcohol, right? Where like if someone drinks it, you get drunk. It, it, one that will, I'll feel really strong in my head that will help me focus might help your body focus better and relax. One that helps your body better might, might be, it, it just, it affects everyone differently. And so that's something to think about too, is that I can tell you what every variety does to me. I even know what they taste like, I know what they smell like, but 
it will do something entirely different with, with your body, the way your body interacts with it. So good question, but mahalo for that. Yeah. Any other questions or thoughts? Yeah. How's it? Um, I wanted to ask a question about just general um, processing after, you know, how you tell if it's uh, mature, yeah. and then the processing of your, your ava, and then... Okay, good there. question. So traditionally, we process it different today and harvest it different today than it was traditionally. Traditionally, ava was left up in the forest by a river, and when they wanted ava, they would go and pull one root, a yeah, fat root, off of a 30-year-old ava plant. We have been blessed in Hawaii to receive introductions of pests and diseases that our kupuna were not challenged with. And I look at them as opportunities and blessings because we have to work around them. So now instead of pulling a root off our plant, we harvest the entire plant. At around two years, your, your, your ava plant will maximize kavalactones. It, that will be as potent as it gets ever. From there, from two years on, all you're doing is building bulk. But now you're playing a gambling game after two years. Yeah? Especially after three to four years. You're gambling with uh, the nematodes that are in your soil. They love ava just as much, or if not more, as we do. And so two to three years seems like the, the prime. Three years, if you, if you can control your nematodes by you know, your mustards, your daikon radishes, your crotalaires, your French marigolds, whatever you can use to consume or repel that nematode is good. Crustacean meal, yeah, crab meal, shrimp meal, put that, in, put that in your hole every time you plant ava. You'll never regret it. Yeah, you'll never have nematode issues. Um, so... I'd say two to three years, it maximizes potency. Anything after that is just getting in bulk, but you're also risking it, getting infiltrated by the nematodes. Nematodes will start in the lateral root, work their way up to the poo, the stump, in the middle. And once it hits there, you have no harvest. And we've pulled out 15-year-old ava plants and gotten nothing out of it. And it's the sickest feeling, right? You invest 15 years. and So, um, yeah. As far as harvesting, now we use a o'o bar um, and... You know, we wash or pressure wash all the roots. We chop them up, wash them real good. And then we, um, you can chop them up into one, two inch squares. Lateral roots are really important. You chop up into one inch pieces and you can just put it in your Vitamix or your Blendtec or Ninja, whatever you have with water and then strain that. Um, and to strain it, I recommend like an unbleached muslin, something that, that is food grade. Um, but for... For harvesting and processing traditionally, our kupuna would harvest a root, and if they had to, a whole plant, because Ali'i was coming, they'd harvest the whole plant, tie it to a rock, a pohaku in the river, a big one, and let the river wash it all night. Ice cold water, right? The river's washing it. Come back in the morning, your roots are clean, ready to be um, drunk. Then they take the roots and they'll either grind it on a stone, yeah, and then mix that ball of, of resiny stone plant material into the water, or they'll, um, mama was a traditional way to chew, yeah, because your saliva extracts better parts of the ava plant than water does, and so they would chew it, chew it, chew it, have a younger, a younger youth chew it, because they have a strong jaw, ava's a tough root to chew, yeah, have a strong jaw, they'll chew, spit it into a big kanoa, and then the ali'i would drink that, yeah, yeah, but a lot of times, with kalo and with ava, being mayao is so critical. Um, being, where's Liliha? Okay, so mayao, how do we define? How do you define mayao? Yeah, come on, mayao. Yeah, kahu alalo. Yeah, come on, mayao. Makolalo haole ke ololu. Mayao. Yeah, Kela. What he said? Yeah, pretty, could be pretty. Um, I guess when you are Mayao, you make things nice, yeah. So that is, that is one definition, but you make, um, you're particular about it too. You're detail oriented. Um, when you made poi for the chief as he came through your village, if there was a little speck in that poi, yeah, there were heyao for you, people like you. Yeah, you better run for South Kona, yeah? Run for that Pu Honua. 
Um, if they're, if, because the easiest way to kill a, a, an opposing chief was through their ava or their poi. And so ava grown on the akia plant took on the properties of the akia and that would kill the, the chief, yeah? Ava grown on the kukui tree would be so bitter. Ava grown on the ohia was preferred. Um, the reason why is because when the sun is exposed to the ava root, it increases your kavalactone count. It makes it really potent. So a lot of people will grow their ava on stones, on rocks and stuff like that to increase their kavalactones. Um, but yeah, traditionally they would hookie it, wash it off, grind it or mama, and then drink. So good question. Any other questions? Could be about kalo too, but also about ava. Aloha. Aloha. Hey, mahalo. Uh, can you just clarify, um, you mentioned briefly um, just the liver contraindications of certain varieties. Yep. Is it, can you talk more about that, please? Because yep. my, my acupuncturist, has, uh, um, she recommended me avoid kava because of the liver. But yep. yeah, thank you. Good question. Yeah, so we have used ava to heal the liver. It's all about what variety you choose. Um, yeah, we had, we had someone with severe liver cancer and also someone with a severe liver infection. Um, the liver wasn't processing things right. Um, and we gave them ava every day for three months, heavy doses of ava. And it, both times it cured the liver issues. So what's interesting is that that is the misconception about ava. Matter of fact, we're fighting the FDA right now to legalize, to, to change ava from a supplement to a nutrient. Because right now, it's just a supplement. And we're also in, in the legislation to get it approved as the official Hawaii state beverage, um, which doesn't mean much to me, but it means a lot to people I work with. And so, um, ava is not toxic for your liver as long as you're drinking noble varieties. That's, that's as, as simple as I'll keep it. There's science behind it. Look up Dr. LeBeau, Vincent LeBeau on YouTube. You'll find all of his toxic, toxicity uh, reports and, and tests that he does in Vanuatu. Um, again, staying away, the only thing that's bad for your liver is that flavocavin B component in those two-day varieties um, or the way you're extracting it. Because what you don't want to do for ava is break the cell walls by a high boil or extract things out of them with alcohol or ethanol. Um, again, like with all of our foods, like, like kalamangai, yeah, I think, um, how let's call it, moringa, yeah? Um, that one, people are powdering it, cool, they're doing all these kind of cool things with it, but if you look at the way traditional societies ate it, it was in soups, right? It was cooked, and, and so, um, just like with ava, the safest and best way to consume ava is the way it was done traditionally, because there's thousands of years of science leading up to that, right? It's not just like, oh, these, these random, you know, uneducated people just thought that's the way to do it, like, no. All of our ancestors were very scientific. And so you can rest assured that, that they have the safest practices. So, so tincture, I'll let you choose that. Yeah, I don't, I don't necessarily um, consume them once it was explained to me in that way. Yeah, And if you are doing tinctures in general, it's always good to just give it a quick sear on the stove and get the alcohol evaporated and then consume just the medicine. But yeah, yeah. question. This is a question from the stream. Uh, can ava be used as la'au or hapai? Is the ava leaf la'au? No, can you intake ava while not, you're hapai? Not internally, no. No. I wouldn't. Although you could make a tea. You could make a tea and, and get a low dose of kavalactones, but I would not consume it too much internally. Um, ava leaves were used as kapai, as poultices for boils. Um, and... You could make a tea out of it, but yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't consume it too much internally. It's what, you, um, it's what we use in La'au to induce miscarriage for wahine, the leaf. You crush it up and you stick it in, um, and they'll pass the baby. If you have a stillborn in you and you can't get it out, yeah. Yeah, so that's what we use to, to pass the baby. But um, general, con general, I don't know why, but my, my kupuna always said, if you're pregnant or breastfeeding, don't drink ava. I don't know mahalo, why. mahalo, anu iloa. If we're not growing ava and we'd like to start drinking it, 
where do you recommend from hip ag or you that we buy and in what form the noble ava to start drinking for health reasons? Yeah. Um, so if you're not growing it, I would recommend you buy it from, I'm not sure if hip ag sells ava, but um, I, I, our friends, Lakia, them have a company called Kanaka Kava and they, they have a bar bar, which I, you know, have my issue with that, but that's their thing. Um, they're doing good things. Um, they have a place in Kona where they sell ava, but Pu'o Hoku Rancho Moloka'i sells fresh frozen ava. Um, that's really ono. Already pulverized, you put it right in your strainer and you lomi lomi. Um, my friend Chris Allen sells powdered ava um, of all the Hawaiian varieties. And Chris Allen, um, he, he owns a company called Hawaii, Hawaiian Gourmet Kava. Yeah, look online. Um, and he, has, he usually has all kinds of varieties on there. But there's lots of options. A simple Google search, I think, would give you. I would recommend staying away from those Fijian sites that sell. Because you can't, I can verify for these farmers I just spoke for. I can verify for Dash, for Lakea, for Chris, for uh, Pu'ohoku Ranch. I can't verify, for, you know, you've got to know your farmer. Especially with Ava. Oh, sorry. I, I'm so sorry. Can I give you my mic to ask the question? Oh. Just because the people on the Zoom cannot hear. Oh. oh, yeah. You can go over there, too. Yeah. I'm sorry to make you stand up. Okay. Um, where would you get starts for both Ava and um, Tara? Okay. Good question. So I know Dash has some for sale, but you can get them from Amy Greenwell Botanical Garden. Yeah. You, they, they have a few Ava varieties there. Um, you can get them from my farm if you're on that side of the island. In Honoka'a side, feel free to come by and get cuttings. Um, you can also get them on other islands as well. Every island has a botanical garden. Like Oahu has Waimea Valley Botanif Botanical Garden. They have all the varieties there. And so yeah, I would just uh, look up a botanical garden and see if they have. Yeah, they're usually willing to share. Nice shirt, Yuri. What's up, brother? How's it? You know, for a long time, I struggled with less than 30% success. Yeah. And I was really stoked for that. And I, I got up another level because of using fresh sphagnum moss. Yeah. I was wondering if you have any tips and tricks. Good, good. He's talking about ava propagation. So, yes, ava propagates best when it's not overly saturated, but it's always moist. And that's, you know, people will, will recommend like two-thirds cinder to one part potting soil. That's fine. You'll lose a ton. If you get a 10% ava germination rate as a starter, I'm proud of you. That's a great, that's a big deal, um, honestly. But yeah, increasing the germination rates, single node propagation, cut the single node, um, dip the ends in alloy. Um, I think you guys, some of you might call it aloe. Um, dip it in that. Get the gel, yeah, dip it in that, and then let that cure and dry, and then you pot them up in sphagnum moss. So you can do the bottom cinder mix and then the top sphagnum moss, but you need sphagnum moss, and the sphagnum moss from the forest is the best one to use. Uh, matter of fact, I'll go in the forest and just set my nodes on a rock that has that moss on it, and then come back and take my babies off when they're ready. Um, but you can also do it at your house. You can do it with the, with the bag store-bought sphagnum peat moss too, but it's not as good. Not as good as the, the green one from the tree. But yeah, that's the highest germination rate is doing it in the moss. All right. I just want to respond to a couple of the questions. I mean, I think right now demand far outstrips supply of AVA. So this is kind of the challenge. And uh, we've, we've been selling some AVA like a little reluctantly, like sometimes because, you know, when you want to pour it for all of your friends, like you only have so much AVA. But we have more coming on. Uh, plant material wise, like we've been planting a lot and our goal with this series again is to drive up the regional production because there's such a need for this crucial medicine. So um, we brought some cuttings today that we can offer uh, for sale and then we're gonna be starting a bunch more in our nurseries because ideally, you know, again, we empower more backyard growers and and uh, also we're gonna be purchasing a Hobart chopper shredder. Oh which is the deal. machine we need for grinding is gonna be here in North Kohala. So when your Ava comes on you know, two years from now, three years from now, you're gonna have a place to grind locally, which for us as farmers has been the biggest bottleneck or challenge because we gotta drive it over to yeah. La Kea's farm and it just, you know, adds to that. 
So we, we do have some fresh Ava. We do have the game because um, yeah, Ava processing is is those machines are, are rare. There's there at one point there was only one on the island, and now there's like three or four, and it looks like there's going to be another one here. That'll change the the Kohala Ava game. Yeah, good job. That's awesome. Okay, one last question, and then I know we gotta get out of here. Aloha, Aloha. Hello. So I wanted to ask a question: What your opinion is on the waxes and the like pressure, you know, um, to create the kava wax and the resin type products that are available I've, um, now? I have no experience with that. Maybe Dash could speak to that, but I don't make yeah, resins and waxes. I'm so sorry. Yeah, mahalo for that though. There's, there's literally a million different Ava products you could, you could find and, and make, but um, I just grow it to, to make the beverage, yeah, but mahalo. Mahalo, Katyana, thank you so much. Can we have a big <laughs> round of applause? So, this is a Oha, yeah, this is Mana'ulu right here. You can tell because Mana'ulu has, it's one you can see from a mile away because it will get this yellow in the primary y vein. These younger ones don't really have it a ton, but they have like this, this yellowing in this primary y vein with the pico. But also Mana'ulu is easy to tell because Mana'ulu and the sister Mana'opelu, their leaves hang straight down like a, like a pendulum. Yeah? So when they come out, they'll hang straight down like this rather than like that or like that, right? But, yeah, Mana'ulu and the Ha, has this, you know, pink blush on it. The kohina should be white. Oh, see, so we're making huli. This is with the oha. I'm just stripping off these old ha. Now, if I'm not gonna, if I'm gonna share my huli, I'm gonna take it down to the last one. If I'm gonna replant it at my place, I'll leave two or three on. Um, as long as I know there's no leaf hoppers, but the leaf hoppers, they hide in these sheaths. And so it's really always good practice to take it down to the last one. It really is. Even at my place, I, I, that's the way I do it every time. And then you want to look for this apex right here in the ha with a new leaf, the mu'o, yeah? Comes out. Yeah, and you want to cut it right above that. So that's your, that's the top of your, your huli. And then what you're looking at here, there's tons of ways to cut huli. You can cut them straight down, snap. You can cut them straight down. Uh, a lot of, a lot of uncles in my PO, they give it like three three slashes like this because they grow low yeah, and they snap. And this is what their hoodie looks like. It has a little point right there. See that? See how, how it has a point? A lot of them do that so that it prevents pocket rot. Because when you cut it flat and you harvest your huli, you, the bottom is always curved in a little yeah. bit, yeah? yeah? So if you do it this way, it prevents that pocket of moisture sitting there because this is, this is a point and the water will drip off of it as it's planted that way. So that's, um, there's tons of ways you can prep huli. I mean, whatever your intention is. Uh, one thing we were talking about the other day in, in a presentation I was giving was um, gathering luau. And so when you gather luau, this is always the best one that you'll ever gather. Yeah? This guy that's not unfurled or barely unfurled. And these guys pull out easy. I just grab them and they pull right out. I call them the Cuban cigars because they are rolled up tight, yeah? And um, these ones are the best because they're not only the most tender, but they break down the fastest in your pot. These kind, if it, if it was all this mu'o, all this mohala, these new shoots, the thing would break down in like 20 minutes in your pot, no problem. And that's because it has less calcium oxalate. As they get older, they, they the calcium oxalate numbers increase dramatically. And so this is number one, we call it the number one leaf. And why do you guys think that you wouldn't find this leaf in stores? Small. Small? What else? Fragile. Fragile. Yeah, it bruises easy. Yeah, very good. So um, number one, when you gather your luau, I'll get number one. I'll just come by. I'll pull it straight off. I'll get a little bit of the ha with it too. And then come by. That was number one. Now we have number two. And if you're really desperate, you can take number three. But I like to leave number three, four, five, six, whatever else is on, because I just like to take a few and allow the, the color to photosynthesize still. Um, if you take all the leaves one time, like our luau industry, they literally come with a machete and they just go, right? They take all of them. 
But now you completely stunt your corn, you jeopardize the overall health of your kalo. It's just not a good practice. So uh, yeah, plant, plant more kalo so you can afford to just take two. And when you gather luau, the way I do them, do them any way you want. If you're not getting the ha, is I'll just take these three fingers, stick my thumb in the pico, stick these two fingers behind the, the lobes, and then you just pry up and out. And what that does is it leaves this little itchy rib on the ha, yeah? And then I'll just stack them in my arm and walk. A lot of people will cut the lao and then go home and restrip this rib. Say, like, oh, that's waste time. Because a lot of itchy is in that rib. Another way to do it, this is a method that we call opea pea. And this, this way, this back, is when your color plant's still in the ground, we just walk by each one and we just take the tips. What that does, we cook that, we eat them, and we leave half the solar panel on for every every ha. And it's called opea pea. Brother, what is the opea pea? You don't know what an opea pea is? A bat, yeah? Why do we call this the bat method? Yeah, it's like a bat, yeah? So th this is an actual method. You can look it up in Pukui's dictionary. It's called opea pea, where you just leave the bat on and you take the tips and we cook them, yeah? So now the kalo can still... Question, yeah. When you do that, like, because I, I hear also, I don't know if it's true or not, but like, you either grow for corn or you grow for for the lot. Yeah. So if you do like the opel opel method, is it would it, your corn still not be affected, and it would yeah. be okay to harvest the lot and the corn? Good, good question, bro. Um, so this method or the other method I showed you of taking number one and number two, you can do that up to three times in a kalo's lifespan without sunting the corn. Anything more than that or any other method, you're gonna stunt the corn. So I do it at like three to four months, I, I take luau from the whole patch. And then I'll go back at like six months, take luau again. And then I'll take the luau when I harvest, right? You get your three harvests of luau, but you don't stunt the corn at all. Yeah, the kalo can handle that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I do sometimes, so what he's talking about is this bottom. It all depends, if I have only a few of these varieties, mana ulu is one I would cut the maka. And what's interesting is when you cut the maka on this mana ulu, you, you don't, it doesn't mana. It doesn't mana. Very rarely does it mana. And so, um, what he's saying is these little makas right here. Let's see if can find them. Yeah, if you have a hard time, you can just take your knife, cut real shallow in here, and then just stick your finger in there and then pry it open that way, yeah? These are your makas. That's your little maka. And that, that, all that's gonna do is give you oha, right? So if you're trying to produce plenty, all you're gonna do is take that guy and cut him off. And this, this guy right here too, that's a little maka, he's hiding. We want to get him off too. All we're trying to do is tell the kalo, we don't want it to produce babies, we want it to produce food. Yeah? And so you can scrape those off, look, look real close, and then you can replant it. And then if you really wanted to get, you know, particular, I would cut my huli if I'm going for production only. Like that. Maybe even a little more shallow. And you're like, oh, God, that's real low. And it is. But Kalo can handle. I still never hit the marriage step. Yeah? I still never hit that, that portion of life. That. And you know, when you plant two, how far apart? So, Pia. Yeah, yeah. So, Kalo, Kalo, the Pia apart. So this is the marriage step right there. You see how much, how much I still have for that? One that right there is the marriage stem. That's the source of life for this hula. And I still have plenty of space. Even though to you it looks like it's low. Yeah. Look how much meat, oh, look how much meat I still have before I hit that plant. Yeah. As long as you don't cut into this this little triangle at the very bottom, you're good. Nice. 
some of the time. Look around and say, oh, look. We look inside. Look how much meat still there before I hit the nurse there. It's tough to see on this right. It's right that little time away. It's easier to see on like one of the darker varieties, the lehuas, the eleeles. The nearest stem will be white, and the heat all around, everything around it will be pink. I just killed a huli. I mean, this is how you make tissue cultures too at the Lions mm -hmm. Arboretum. They'll take this nearest stem out, they'll piece it up into different chunks, and then repot them in these gel sugar solutions and regrow them sterile varieties. Um, you could probably make off of one huli, you know, five to eight sterile new plants. Tiny little germs. But yeah. Speaking of which, if you only got one huli and you want to make more as fast as you can, how would you cut it? Okay, good question. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, the first thing I would do is take this right here, throw it in a Ziploc bag. That right there. Throw it in your Ziploc bag. And leave the top like halfway closed. Don't add moisture. There's plenty of moisture in here when you hook it. Leave that in your Ziploc bag and you'll notice within two weeks, every single eyelet, every maca on here will start to pop. Yeah? And you can get probably 20 kalo plants off of this one little corn. You sacrifice the food, but you're getting the, the keiki. And then the second, the second way to do it is you're just going to take this. When you cut your huli, you're going to leave a lot more of the corn on. This is just for planting method, not for, and this is for uh, prepping huli, not the planting method. So instead of leaving just a little bit on, I'm gonna come a little bit lower, quarter inch is good, and I'll leave a little bit more on. Honestly, anything more than this is not good for your kalo. Yeah, it's tinted colors of Quarter inch is what I'd hold max. You leave a lot of maca still on, yeah, to get more oha to spread that variety. Yeah, that, the corm is one in the Ziploc bag, this is one back in the ground. Plant it real shallow, if you can, plant it shallow, because deep planting produces less oha, shallow planting produces more. Face this, usually there's a bend. This is the bend. Face that bend towards the setting sun. Where are we? Where does the sun set? You guys know. Huh? Huh? Everyone's pointing different directions. Ish, okay? Yeah, setting sun, that's a Hina style. And that, because what when you plant it that way, this mama plant allows for these babies to come up and catch the sun first. You get a lot more babies that way. Yeah? Um, so, plant it hina style, plant it shallow, and cut the corn big, and then propagate the corn as well. You get choke babies. One generation I could probably get. Mana ulu, we're looking at maybe 10 oha of this plant into 12 oha, plus another Looking at over 20 plants off this one plant, easy, wow. yeah, if you're doing that way. So, good questions, yeah? So, uh, uh, what are your biggest pests? I don't have the mosaic, but I get plenty of white fly. Yeah, I don't have any white fly. Um, so, white fly is a big pest for the ava. Foma, shot hole virus, is a big one. I got a little... And that's, that's easy enough to mitigate with um, micronized sulfur. Buy, buy micronized sulfur, dilute it in water, and foliar spray it, and, and that thing goes away fast. So, um, honestly, it's spacing. Like, we all struggle with enough land to plant on, and so we space things too close, and so the pests just buffet, right? They just go nuts. Spacing is key, fallowing is key, which I know you practice, you ro crop rotation. So the spacing for all of I Ideally, it would be 10 feet. Yeah. Ideally. Yeah. yeah. Especially if you're not going to harvest them all at one time. Yeah. But um, other ones for Ava is the cucumber mosaic virus. Um, get rid of your Hono Hono grass. Hono Hono grass, when it crawls, in, that, that's the host for that virus. And so if that's ca crawling on your Ava, it, the aphids will, will act as a vector really simply. Um, those are the main ones for Ava, root nine nematode. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Also uh, important, like, what would be important to like feed your ava plant? Good, what, good. What do you think, like, to uh, the process for that, like, feeding it or keeping it healthy? You know, we did a fun, we, just for fun, we did an experiment where we tried to over-fertilize our ava. We tried to burn them. 
how much can this plant take? We choose synthetic fertilizer like the hell. We don't use that, but we want to see, right? And we could not burn the Ava plant. It sucked up everything we fed it. So what does that tell you? Ava is a heavy nutrient sucker. It will take all the nutrients you have and more. So if you're doing it organically, which we are, a lot of, a lot of you guys will be as well, just make sure you keep feeding it composted material, organic matter, um, composted manures. I mean, that thing will suck everything. Yeah. Yeah, but again, that crustacean meal has been the most critical amendment that I buy for Ava. And another question, would you ever prune it? Yeah, Ma, good questions, you guys. So, yeah, so for Ava pruning, it is, it is critical that you prune your Ava every six months, a year max. And what I'm talking about is when you have your Ava plant, you'll have stems that go straight up, stems that go kind of diagonal, and then stems that are lying down, the low-hanging branches, yeah? You want to always prune every six months those low-hanging branches because you're going to expose the roots to more sun. You're going to tell the ava that it cannot just make leaf, that it has to store its energy in its root system and in its stump, in its poo. And you explode the poo. As soon as you hit those, the poo explodes. Like you're going to see it get bigger. And that's what we want. And so you're telling it you cannot grow leaves too much, Throw it all in your, in your stump, in your roots. And then what's great about Ava is the more we share Ava, the more it, it benefits us. So the more we share those cuttings with other people, it's just benefiting us in the end. So yeah, definitely prune it, get the airflow in there good, yeah? Good question. Paul. Huh? In trouble, we over time. Yeah, I don't know. Where's Maya? We're good. We're good. I know, I'm just I'm scared of Maya and she comes holding me. Oh. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned using um, uh, aloe or aloe vera when you take the cuttings. Yeah. What about like commanding For other. With the aloe. Oh yeah, you could, you could. Uh, my favorite companion plants for Ava are, I'll do like a ground cover, sometimes a perennial peanut, and, and I will say that perennial peanut has become a, it's a little bit tougher to harvest. You gotta roll the carpet back before you, but you know, it's tap rooted for the most part. But I'll have a nitrogen fixer ground cover with my Ava, one that doesn't climb. I'll have a low growing broadleaf nematode repellent. It can be, it could be a coronalaria species. You get your nitrogen and your, but uh, I really like mustard. I really like daikon radish. And I really love, like, if you grow alba, French marigolds are your best friend. Not any marigold, but the French marigold, because they consume and kill nematodes. Root not nematodes, specifically. And so, I broadcast seed all around. As soon as I plant my alba, the seed gets broadcast with it. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> you know, my agroforest in order to do some of my hand. And I put uh, a wire around with the kind, you know, so that easy for harvest. Yeah. yeah. And then and then I put all my um, nutrients in there and uh, mounts, whatever. Yeah. How 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 high should I make that cage? Good question, yeah. And how wide? Good question. So it depends on what kind of extra fencing material you have. So if it's a regular four foot fencing material you're working yes. with, and you don't want to cut it in half, you want to keep it whole, you're going to need it to be like probably three feet in diameter. Three feet. If it's a four foot hog wire. If you're going to cut that four foot hog wire in half to make them lower to the ground, you just double the width or six feet wide. You know, it's going to be red, so we get plenty extra of that. So can I just pull it in half and then, you know? Oh yeah, can. And, and, then, and then what, put some kind of, uh, I don't want to say plastic, but yeah, no, we met. Just so that we met. Yeah, yeah. we met. And and, and three feet, three feet, and then so when you harvest, you don't have to dig. Yeah, yeah you just unhook the wires. Yeah. yeah, you unhook the wire, and you open it up, shake off the cinder and dirt, right. and your whole harvest is right there. It's really efficient. But what I will say is that, and that repels nematodes really good too, as long as there's drainage. But what I will say is you have to amend heavily, like because the ava likes to eat. So you, you have to you have to put plenty of organic matter inside. Yeah. Just keep stacking them. You can see them break down, stack them again, break down, and um, yeah, it makes it makes harvesting easy. Digging them out of the ground is tough work, you guys. It's tough work. We do them, but yeah. 
good question. Yeah. So, um, regarding the Kalo or Avo? Okay, so Kalo prefers full sun. It does well in agroforestry systems though. I've seen massive um, heirloom Kalo in agroforestry systems. So full sun is preferred, but it, it does thrive if the nutrients are rich. It does thrive in, in, in overstory as well, partial shade. Um, for Ava, it, it likes full shade when you're propagating it. That's what people don't realize. I propagate mines in a black dark growth. Because you got to think about when Ava's propagating in a forest, they're growing in full shade. And then, so let's full shade when it's young, transition to like 80 or 60% shade when it's about a foot high. I outplanted at a foot and a half high. And when the plant is a foot and a half in the pot. And that needs about 30 per, 30% shade. So coconut frond is perfect because you bend the coconut frond over this as a hale. By the time the coconut frond disintegrates, now he's ready for full sun. Alva likes full sun after about, about a year, six months to a year, full sun. This guy, he don't like wind. The papa varieties, the low growing can handle a little bit. These taller guys, they don't like, they don't like, but can, I mean can, but. Uh. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about, the Alva. Oh, oh, the color, the color don't mind. The color can handle wind, although like if it's like, Whipping wind, I've seen the wind bolo head all the leaves. Yeah, I take all the leaves off. But, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so all, all of them can be grown dry land. Like, you know, can grow them in straight water. They, they, don't, they don't really love that. They like being near the water, but not right into it. Yeah. Kauai hai. Woo! Ah, well, better you come Kohala. Get there, Ava. Because yeah. <laughs> yeah, Koi Hai is. It's a, it's a rough environment. It's a good place for drying, Ava. Oh. <laughs> Make the solar convection oven. One side your greenhouse white plastic, one side black plastic. The Ava cooks in like two days, Koi Hai. You can make a solar convection oven that way. Yeah, sorry. Koi Hai is tough, this plant. Can. I, n I never say no can. I always say try. Try. Organic material just doesn't stay in the soil in Kauai, and then when you water it, it just the water doesn't go in. Yeah, hydrophobic runs off. So yeah, we have some. We have an auntie and uncle that live over there that are ex expressed that they're experiencing some difficulties in trying to propagate anything. Can heal them though. Can heal them. Yeah. The best way to water, our friend just told us last night, is he make the big five gallon jug or water jug, or whatever. You, you poke them with the pin. And so it's just a slow drip to the point where you're not losing it and it trains the soil to be to maintain that moisture again. Yeah. So you just leave the jug outside and poke, poke them with the pin. That pin drip, you know, will slowly just drip and feed. But yeah, tough. You can heal them though, but tough. Any other questions before we close this up? We're gonna have to stop on questions. We're done. <laughs> really? I was waiting for her cub this whole week. <laughs> I'm so sorry. No, you're good. Uh, we knew it was we coming. Have, we have this masterful musician here with yeah, us, and we want to honor his time as well. So, uh, John Kiyabe is going to get.